News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion. Look at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. And welcome to GB News Live with me, Mark Longhurst. Coming up uh, this Wednesday, it's Prime Minister's Questions, or should we say Deputy Prime Minister's Questions, live from the House of Commons. Uh, Rishi Sunak, of course, stateside uh, with uh, Joe Biden, President Biden in Washington. So today it's the stunt doubles acting up. Oliver Dowden to face Labour Deputy uh, Angela Rayner. And worth noting, perhaps, that the Deputy Prime Minister is also Secretary of State in the Cabinet Office. So could he face a few difficult questions from Angela Lorena over the legal tussle to hand over material to Baroness Hallett's COVID inquiry. But plenty more on the agenda too. We'll bring you all that live in just under 10 minutes time. But there is that other big story in town too. Of course, Prince Harry back in the High Court. So uh, Michael Cole, royal commentator, former royal correspondent, uh, has been following the events today. He joins us in the studio just to uh, update you because um, we've got the, the cross-examination continuing. F pretty forensic, as we were expecting, from Andrew Green. But some interesting lines where um, they're drawing parallels between another newspaper group, Mm -hmm. uh, which is news and um, the, the news of the world and, and uh, the uh, Murdoch Empire. The Murdoch Empire, yeah. News Corps. Yeah, News Corps. And, and Mr Green is saying, look, there was evidence provided in a, in a, a criminal case involving that, specifics about the calls. Mm. You haven't got that. Mm. That's precisely what he's doing, uh, to remind people... Uh, the royal editor, in quotes, of the News of the World, Clive Goodman, uh, employed a man called Glenn Mulcair to do the hacking for him. Uh, Clive Goodman was known in the office as the eternal flame because he never went out of the office. Mm. The information came into him, and the information came in from Glenn Mulcair, and on the basis of that, he wrote stories. And, and Glenn Mulcair had an industrial-sized uh, plant for hacking into messages. He hacked into me. I was one of the people who was hacked. 
um, and I uh, received an apology in due course from a senior executive at News Group and a modest amount of, um, of damages which I didn't ask for. But that's what happened. Now, those two gentlemen went to jail. Yeah, because this was a criminal them. action. Criminal action, they both went to jail. So, Andrew Green, KC, who is the counsel for Mirror Group newspapers, is contrasting that and saying, look, here is this case, not involving Mirror Group newspapers, involving a rival uh, group yeah. at, that was punished and, in, incidentally, that was exposed by a free press. The Guardian exposed that, yeah. that, that scandal. Yeah. And so he's saying to Prince Harry, OK, where is your evidence? Where and, is your evidence? And indicating that at this time, back in, what, 2005, 2006, the inquiry is looking at that, wide-ranging, i.e., why wasn't this picked up by the Mirror at that time? Exactly, and precisely so. And, and at that time, uh, there was a sort of general uh, alarm. Where else was this going on? And it was said at the time that it was an isolated incident uh, confined to this area. And it came about, if you remember, actually not by the hacking of, uh, of Prince Harry's phones. It came about because they hacked Millie Dowler's phone. Yes. And Rupert Murdoch, the ultimate boss of the company, said it was the most humiliating moment of his life mm. to sit in front of a Commons committee and be asked about how they'd hacked the phone of a child who had been murdered. Yep. And that's what brought that about. So Andrew Green is saying, look, this is terrible stuff. These people went to jail. It was punished. Right. Now, what, what about Mirror Group newspapers? He's almost helping, he's trying to help Prince Harry to provide the evidence now, you and I, we've read through all the testimony this morning. I've been desperately looking for a smoking gun, yeah, but not there's not there. even a no, gun. Indeed. On that very topic, let's cross uh, to join Cameron, our royal correspondent, who has been at the court uh, proceedings today. Uh, and Cameron, obviously, there are various incidents being talked about, but again, Mr Green saying, look, this was reported elsewhere in the, in the press. It was not specific. Yes, and that does seem to be a running theme, actually, Mark. I mean, I've been sat in the courtroom all morning with Prince Harry, who, to be fair to him, does seem a lot more across the detail than perhaps he was yesterday of the 33 articles uh, he is complaining about and are being tested in this case. Uh, but one such article dated 16th September 2007 from, uh, I think it was the Sunday Mirror, details of a relationship between his former girl girlfriend, Chelsea Davey, and three arguments she had before uh, they moved uh, to Leeds. Now, Prince Harry believes that the information about the arguments came from phone hacking, and Prince Harry uh, said, con confirms to the court that those whole, the whole article is suspicious and that he never gave details of the relationship between him and Chelsea Davey or indeed the arguments to anybody, particularly uh, anyone working at the palace, and said the reason why he thinks it's suspicious is because the palace source quoted in this Mirror article um, were, um, just could not have been accurate because he didn't speak to anyone in the palace about his relationship and therefore for, it must have come from phone hacking or another um, means of unlawful information gathering. Now, Mr Green, who's representing Mirror Group newspapers, says, but you accept that the royal editor who wrote this story would have had contacts uh, within the palace. Prince Harry believes, he, in response, that he believes his voicemail was listened to, and then the, Mirror, the, the journalist created the story around it by listening to his voicemail. So Mirror Group newspaper's barrister asked him whose phone did this material come from, which voicemail was listened to, um, and then challenged Prince Harry, saying that we are in the realms of speculation. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, details that have been coming out, but these two fundamental points. The barrister continues to challenge Prince Harry on this idea that a lot of what he is saying is speculation, and as you were saying, there's no smoking gun, smoking gun there's no concrete evidence, uh, but also the fact that some of this information has already been published previously by other newspapers, particularly the News of the World uh, or, 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 or a different news publication. Um, one of Prince Harry's um, continued um, defences of, of that as to why it, 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 matter, it doesn't matter that other articles have already been published about a bit of information is because he believes that the editors at the Daily Mirror, Sunday Mirror, Sunday People would have been kicking the desks of their royal journalists 
yelling at them, asking why on earth was this an exclusive of the News of the World or the Daily Mail or something like that, and it wasn't our story. And because the royal journalist was under pressure, that in turn would incentivize them right. to allegedly hack a voicemail or engage in some other unlawful information gathering. That is what Prince Harry has been arguing in court today. And, and more to come this afternoon, of course. Cameron, for the moment, thank you for that. But let's actually move back to uh, the House of Commons and uh, the chamber where Lindsay Hoyle, the Speaker, is about to get Prime uh, Deputy Prime Minister's questions uh, as it is today. Underway, Oliver Darden facing you, Angela Rayner. I have been asked to reply. My right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, is in Washington at the invitation of President Biden. Yeah. They will be discussing cooperation on a range of issues, including AI and global trade, and of course, continuing our leadership in galvanising international support for the people of Ukraine. Yeah. Mr Speaker, this week is Carers Week. I know that colleagues across the House will wish to join me in paying tribute to the huge contribution unpaid carers make to our society. Yeah. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. David Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. At the election, the Labour Party committed to abolishing SATs, Academy Schools and Ofsted, three policies given to them by an education union that also opposed this government's use of phonics. And yet, thanks to this government's use and focus on phonics, English primary school children have just been ranked the best readers in Europe. So does my right honourable friend agree with me? This is another example of why on this side of the house we have policy to meet the needs of children rather than meet the demands of trade unions. It won't surprise my honourable friend to hear that I absolutely agree with him. Driving up literacy rates is central to our plan to grow the economy, so I'm delighted at those latest figures showing that children in England are the best readers in the Western world. And why is that, Mr Speaker? Because since 2010, we've raised the number of schools rated good or outstanding by nearly 30 per cent. And the verdict is clear. Only the Conservatives can be trusted with our children's future. Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Angela Rayner. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Speaking of the last election, the Tory manifesto promised to end the abuse of the judicial review. How's it going? <laughs> well, I, I welcome the much shorter question from the Right Honourable Lady today. Well, let me just remind the Right Honourable Lady of a few facts about the COVID inquiry. We set up the COVID inquiry. We have provided it with more than 55,000 documents so far. We have given it all the financial resources it needs so that we can learn the lessons from the pandemic. But, Mr Speaker, in Wales, they also had a pandemic. And what have the Labour-run Wales authorities done there? No independent inquiry in Wales. As ever, one rule for Labour and another for everyone else. Mr Speaker, he acts like it pretends that it's complicated, but it's simple. They set up the inquiry to get to the truth, then blocked that inquiry from getting the information that it asked for, and now they're taking it to court. I know he considers himself a man of the people, so using his vast knowledge of working-class Britain, does he think working people will thank him for spending hundreds of thousands of pounds of their money on loophole lawyers just so that the government can obstruct the COVID inquiry? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, we will provide the inquiry with each and every document related to COVID, including all internal discussions in any form as requested, while crucially protecting what is wholly and unambiguously irrelevant. Because essentially, the Right Honourable Lady is calling for years' worth of documents and messages between named individuals to be in scope. And that, Mr Speaker, 
could cover anything from civil servants' medical conditions to intimate details about their families. But I really will say to the Right Honourable Lady, I find it extraordinary that she should lecture us on value for money for the taxpayer, when I understand she has now purchased two pairs of noise-cancelling headphones on expenses. <laughs> now, I will be fair. I will be fair to the Right Honourable Lady. If I had to attend shadow cabinet meetings, I think I'd want to tune them out too. Can, can I just say that Deputy Prime Minister was very good saying he was welcoming short questions. I'd also welcome shorter answers. Mr Speaker, all we're asking for is what the COVID inquiry has asked for. And across the world, COVID inquiries are well underway, while his government hides information and shells out public money on legal bills for the Oxbridge One, the former Prime Minister is now demanding another million to pay for his new lawyers. Now, I know the honourable gentleman and his former boss has fallen out, and maybe he wants to patch things up, but can he seriously say this is a good use of taxpayers' money? Yes. Deputy Prime Minister. Well, if we want to talk about relationships between, between different people, I don't think we need to search her WhatsApp messages to know that there's no communication between her and the leader of her party. And I will happily, happily stand up for our record on COVID. Because when she and her party were carping from the sidelines, calling for longer lockdowns, I was working as culture secretary to keep our football clubs running, to protect our theatres and museums, and deliver the largest cultural recovery package in the Western world. That's the difference between her and me, Mr Speaker. While she was collecting titles, I was getting on with the job. Mr Speaker, I know for the last couple of years he's been trying to prep PM Prime Ministers for this, but these punchlines are dire. He really (laughs) needs to go back to school himself. And speaking of school... Thousands of children are missing from school. Absence has nearly doubled since before the pandemic. The Prime Minister says he's maxed out on his support for school pupils. But why did the government abandon its plans for a register of missing children? Deputy Prime Minister. Well, on the specifics of the Right Honourable Lady's question, that is not the case, and we continue to keep the policy under review. And what I would say is I am... I am very proud of this government's record on funding and support for schools. Four billion pounds more this year, four billion pounds next year, and the result of all of that investment is we have the highest standards of reading in the entire Western world. What a contrast from when the party opposite were in power. Angela Rayner. So there we have it, Mr Speaker. Thousands of children missing under review still. So let me ask him about another uh, something else that's gone missing. The Public Accounts Committee this week revealed that the government's fraud increased fourfold, mm. with ministers overseeing the loss of £21 billion of taxpayers' money in the last two years. Can he tell us how much of our money they expect to recover? Yeah. Deputy Prime Minister. Well... Mr Speaker, we are working tirelessly to recover those funds and have made and we have made huge progress already. But again, if the party opposite wants to talk about wants to talk about good use of taxpayers' money, what do we have from the party opposite? Plans for an unfunded twenty eight billion pound spending spree. And what would that do? drive up borrowing, push up interest rates, adding £1,000 to everyone's mortgage. Mr Speaker, I know they're out of touch, but even she must realise that Britain cannot afford Labour. Angela Rayner. Mr Speaker, Britain can't afford any more of the Conservatives. He seems to have lost count. The answer is a quarter. 
Only a quarter of the billions of pounds of taxpayers' money lost to fraud is expected to be clawed back. If this government can't get the public money back, they can't be trusted with anything else. It's become a pattern of behaviour from the Conservatives. An inquiry missing the evidence, schools missing their pupils, taxpayers missing their money and ministers missing in action. And all the while... Working people pay the price for their mistakes. This week, the Public Accounts Committee also warned that this epic fraud and waste could happen all over again due to the ministers living in denial of the facts. If his government can't admit the truth, then how on earth can they learn the lessons? Deputy Prime Minister. Well, I would say to the Rising Lady, we're actually putting more resources in throughout this year to tackle fraud and error, and we continue to make real progress with it. But again, it's, it's quite extraordinary from the, from, the, from the party opposite. While we are working to drive down inflation and energy bills, what, what's the Right Honourable Lady doing? Receiving £10,000 from Just Stop Oil backers. Adopting their policies, backing protesters, blocking new production, and forcing us to import more foreign oil and gas. Do you know what? For once, Mr. Speaker, I find myself in agreement with the GMB union. What did they say? It's naive, lacks intellectual rigour and could decimate communities, just like Labour. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The the latest route update for East West Rail has recently been published, and unfortunately, the link to Aylesbury is still just a dotted line on the map. Now, I've raised the need for this vital link on several occasions in the House because it will cut congestion on our roads, it will stimulate the economy and it will reduce air pollution. Each time I've been asked to work with stakeholders to reduce the cost, I'm really pleased to say we've managed to do that. There is now a much cheaper proposal on the table, so can my right honourable friend now please change that dotted line into a solid line and give my constituents the railway they do want? I know my honourable friend is an absolutely tireless campaigner for this project, and I can assure him that the Department for Transport is working with Network Rail and the East West Rail Company to consider the feasibility of lower cost railway links on the Aylesbury Spur, and I know that he will continue to make that case very, very vigorously. We now come to the Deputy Leader of the SNP, Murray Black. Thank you, Mr Speaker. When the Prime Minister took office, he said he would put economic stability and confidence at the heart of this government. <laughs> Today, UK interest rates are one of the highest in the G20, and mortgage rates are rising nearly back to where they were after the former PM crashed the economy. Is it not the case that this government's biggest achievement is that they're trashing the economy just a wee bit slower than their predecessor? <laughs> Well, I don't know whether the Honourable Lady had been following the news today, but actually, again, the OECD upgraded our growth forecasts. And, and really, one, one month ago, I, the whole nation came together celebrating that wonderful moment of pomp, pageantry and pride in our nation. And what did the, right, what did the Honourable Lady describe it as? I quote, I quote, Mr Speaker, a pantomime. Well, the real pantomime is the SNP in Scotland. Are they black? I don't know what question the Deputy Prime Minister was asking, but let me try another one. The government plans, this government plans to cut taxes for the richest, spend £6 billion imprisoning people fleeing war and persecution, and has lost £21 billion to government fraud throughout this pandemic. Is the view from the Prime Minister's luxury helicopter so skewed that during a cost of living crisis he thinks this is what people's priorities are? I'm going to take no lectures on profligacy from the, from, from the SNP. And actually, what, 
What is it that this government has done? We have provided record increases to the personal allowance, meaning that a person working full-time on the minimum wage has seen a £1,000 reduction in their tax. Well, Benzie. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Fylde uh, you know, has many vibrant small shops that are the beating heart of the economy. Mm. But St Anne's Town Centre has got fantastic potential, but its layout, quite frankly, is becoming tired. Investment is needed to reinvigorate the town centre, better connecting it to the seafront and reinvigorate the town. What steps am a right honourable friend taking to continue this government's levelling up mission to deliver for towns like St Anne's? Deputy Prime Minister. Well, that's precisely why uh, we've created the levelling up fund and there's £3.6 billion within that in the towns fund to be invested in high streets up and down the country. And we will be outlining the third round of submissions to that fund. And I'm quite sure my honourable friend will make a very vigorous case for his constituency for funding during that round. And David. Speaker, yesterday I met Karen. Karen is a carer for her husband, Alan, who has Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia. Karen told me how hard it is to get people with power just to listen to her. Like so many carers, Karen feels her caring work just isn't valued. At times, she's wanted to give up, but knows she must carry on because of her husband. Mr Speaker, remarkable carers like Karen save the government more than the entire NHS budget. So will the government finally recognise the value of Britain's family carers and not just pay tribute to them, but give them the financial and practical support they deserve? Deputy Prime Minister. Well, of course I would like to join the right honourable gentleman in paying tribute to, to Karen and to hard-working, unpaid carers up and down the country. And I know the right honourable gentleman speaks from personal experience about this as well. We have provided £2.3 billion worth of support for social care, an additional £25 million committed to putting people at the heart of care in the heart of care white paper, and £327 million is also committed to the Better Care Fund. Alberta Costa. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Many of my constituents are deeply concerned about the proposals for the 440-acre Hinkley National Rail Freight Interchange and the impact that this proposed site has on the environment and, for example, on infrastructure like Narbra Railway Station. Now, I know the Deputy Prime Minister cannot talk about an individual planning application that is for central government to make, but can he give an assurance to my South Leicestershire constituents, to Blaby District Council, like Councillor Ben Taylor, Councillor Maggie Wright, Terry Richardson, Mike Shirley and others, that the voice of my constituents will be heard in this planning application. Prime Minister. Well, I know from the, the vigorous campaigning of the Honourable Gentleman that his constituents' voice has been and will be heard. As he knows, I can't comment on individual cases. What I can say, Mr Speaker, is I have experience of this in my own constituency as well, and I know what a blight can be provided by those rail freight projects. So I do have every sympathy for the case that he is making. Bonnie Cowan. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister, this week we heard plans for two universal basic income pilots in England. There have been similar schemes planned for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. With the progress of the gig economy and the acceleration of artificial intelligence, it is clear that the working environment will need drastically overhauled. Will this government waken up to the reality of the situation and instruct both the DWP and HMRC to engage with these pilots so we can constructively assess the pros and cons and work to safeguard a less precarious future for the next generation? Well, Mr Speaker, the, the Government and I have never been uh, convinced about the case for a universal basic income. We are not alone in that. It is also the position of Paul Johnson at the IFS. I think a much better solution 
is to create more jobs, which this government has done, and cut taxes on working people, which is what this government has done. That is the route for prosperity for people up and down the country. Lynn Foster. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Revitalising Old Way, regenerating our town centres and helping Torbay's high-tech sector to grow would deliver levelling up for Torbay. What expectations does he have of the new levelling up partnership in focusing government effort and resources on doing this? Deputy Prime Minister. Well, uh, as, as I'm sure my honourable friend knows, uh, levelling up partnerships are committed to work hand in hand with 20 places across England in most need of that levelling up. They're backed by £400 million worth of investment, and I know that my honourable friend will make the case most robustly for funding for his constituency. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. After 13 years, the Government has repeatedly broken its promise to repair social care. Post-pandemic, I've been visiting sheltered housing schemes in Hornsey and Wood Green, and time after time, basic services, dentistry, podiatry, befriending, are all missing. Will the government take urgent action and repair this mess, or will it be down to Labour again to pick up the pieces? Well, for the NHS as a whole, this government has provided record additional funding. And indeed, since we came to power in 2010, funding is up £70 billion. And in addition, in respect of social care, that my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, has provided a further £2.3 billion worth of support to this vital sector. Dame Andrea I congratulate the Government for its determination to bring forward the rollout of electronic patient records for everyone in England. And can I ask my right honourable friend to confirm that this gives us a brilliant opportunity to roll out the digital version of the Red Book that is so transformational for every family in giving their baby the best start for life. Prime Minister. I totally agree with my right and friend, and I, I know what a tireless campaigner she has been on this issue, both in and out of government. And yes, I am I'm happy to confirm that the so called digital red book will be rolled out, and we expect it to be delivered over the course of the next two years. Gavin Newland. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Deputy Prime Minister likes to call himself Mr. Normal. He went to a normal school, and he understands normal people. We know that normal people are struggling in this Tory cost of living crisis. People like nurses, who he said had unreasonable wage demands. Ah. This is the same person who, on top of his £154,000 salary, charged two businesses over 13 grand for just 20 hours' work. Ah. That's £670 per hour. Yep. Does Mr Normal really think he's worth 65 times a band two nurses? Ah. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not quite sure what the, the, the question was aiming at, but what I can say to the... What I can, what I can say, what, what I can say to the, the honourable gentleman is actually this government has provided over three thousand pounds worth of support to help. So that is uh, the deputy prime minister, of course, uh, uh, Oliver Dowden, on his feet. Just to remind you, it's the deputies in place because Rishi Sunak, of course, uh, is in Washington meeting uh, with Joe Biden. Uh, but certainly, in terms of Angela Rayner on the other side of the dispatch box, uh, came uh, off a stool, uh, off out of a corner with a straight right to the chin, uh, basically asking Oliver Dowden a question about the uh, Tory manifesto pledge to end the abuse of judicial review. How's it going? she asked uh, to cheers from the Labour bench. Let's get reaction now. Down at Westminster, our political reporter uh, Olivia Utley uh, is there. Olivia, it was a bit of an uncomfortable, well, three rounds, it seemed, for Oliver Dowden there in the um, mismatch. <laughs> Absolutely. It feels as though Angela Rayner is very much getting in her stride at PMQs. And often the questions that work best are those very short, sharp ones. And Oliver Dowden certainly felt on the back foot when asked about the COVID inquiry. It was interesting the extent to which Angela Rayner talked about the abuse of taxpayer money, because that is an issue which I'm hearing a lot among Conservative backbench MPs. They are worried about the government being so reluctant to hand over this information and going to the extent of getting lawyers 
on side and going ahead with a full judicial review. They are worried that it's beginning to look like a cover up to the country and they're worried about the use of taxpayer funds to go ahead with this. So the fact that Angela Rayner was echoing that worry is quite significant. She also talked, I think it was her fourth question, about the ghost children, the children who are not in school anymore after COVID. And she put Oliver Dowden on the spot on the government promising to, to keep tabs on those children and seemingly failing to do so. Well, that is another issue which is really concerning Conservative MPs. So the, it wasn't really surprising that what we saw there was a lot of noise, a lot of excitement on the Labour front benches and a pretty muted reaction to the Deputy Prime Minister from the Conservative benches. Response perhaps from the, those back benches, as you say, because clearly it's this issue of financial competence that she was trying to raise. Uh, also going on this issue of the um, the Public Accounts Committee and the fraud, as they've uh, earmarked it, twenty one billion pounds missing. Absolutely. Again, this is an issue which deeply concerns both Conservative MP, MPs and the general public. Every time this issue of fraud is raised in, in focus groups, we saw it over the pandemic, misuse of uh, PPE, etc., awarding the wrong contracts as well to, to, to sort of friends of, of the government, etc. This idea of cronyism and fraud plays very, very badly indeed with the public, and Angela Rayner knew that. And yeah, not surprising that perhaps Conservative MPs weren't particularly willing to... to to cheer in the way that they sometimes are for the Deputy Prime Minister. It was an awkward session all round and as I say it does feel very much as though Angela Rayner has got in her stride. Perhaps unsurprising given just how many Prime Minister's questions Rishi Sunak ha has missed. There was a table today showing that he was bottom of the league for Prime Minister attending oh, PMQs. That's right. because he's been globetrotting Absolutely. Yeah. He's been globetrotting since he became Prime Minister. And, and you know, but there are many in the Conservative Party who think that's a very good thing, that it's necessary to, to reset international relations after quite a tumultuous period under Boris Johnson and Liz Truss. But it has meant that the Deputy Prime Minister and the shadow uh, Angela Rayner have managed to get quite a lot of practice in. And it felt today as though Angela Rayner really had the upper hand. Interesting point. And, of course, reflecting on Mary Black's point about being in that helicopter, uh, whizzing from place to place uh, as well. Well, but Olivia, for the moment, down at Westminster, thank you very much indeed for that. Let's uh, now introduce our um, panel of MPs who've been watching, perhaps rather uncomfortably for some, former Trade Minister, <laughs> Environment Secretary, Deputy Chair of the Conservative Party as well, uh, Member of Parliament for North East Hampshire, Anil Jawadina, and uh, Labour MP for Birmingham, Perry Bar, Khalid Mahmoud. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us. Um, Raniel, first of all, um, that was a bit uncomfortable for Oliver Dowden, wasn't it? Well, I mean, I think the, uh, the, the move of the, uh, the House of Commons was uh, really trying to get a grip on the relationship between the two of them. I think there's a, a lot of uh, personal Because uh, he, he did all right last time the two of them met. He sort of survived it, was, I think, was, was the view of many. Uh, I, I think last time uh, he, he landed his lines really well. But, you know, on this uh, stuff around the COVID inquiry, I mean, the, the points that uh, Labour rightly uh, are not uh, pointing out, because it would not be in their interest, but we should be pointing out, which he didn't, was, of course, under Chilcot, Butler, Hutton. The Labour Party never had handed over these unredacted uh, messages and memos and whatever. And a lot of money was spent on lawyers on those occasions. Indeed so. Yeah. So, you know, those are the sorts of lines that perhaps he should have landed today. Is it the case that he over-prepared, that he had his script uh, and maybe um, it wasn't just the fact that the, the punchlines were dire, as Angela Rayner indicated, <laughs> but it was the delivery. It was all in the timing, as the comedians say. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the mood of the House didn't respond as well as they did last time. Uh, but I think sometimes you've got to go on the substance of these issues. Right. And uh, perhaps that was the failing. And talking about the substance, uh, clearly Labour is identifying this issue um, of not just financial competence in terms of the crashing the economy, but waste. You know, taxpayers' money being wasted That's on right. lawyers, wasted on, on fraud and, and, and money going missing. On the new immigration bill, six, million, six billion pounds uh, to bear it down to that. So there is a huge amount of waste when we need money in the National Health Service, uh, in our education sectors, in our local government uh, to support those people who need the most support that we, we should be getting out to them.
Yeah, and, and Angela Rayner um, getting a bit of a cheer from the back benches as well. Um, she seems to have learnt the lesson of, of keeping her questions, well, not, not just short, but sharp as well. I mean, that first one she came it's in was the, really yeah. difficult to That's right, to but it's the delivery. Step. I think what she's done is she's focused and she delivered it well uh, <coughs> and moved forward. That's why she got the response from, from our back benches. Uh, and fortunately, Oliver didn't uh, because he just couldn't uh, raise their levels uh, by, by being more... Uh, uh, sort of uh, not aggressive, but 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 strong. Do you think they enjoyed it rather more than Keir Starmer, who is criticised for being a bit dull and because of his legal no, training? We've got two, different, we got two, it up we got two different people. We got Sir Keir uh, and we got Angela. Two different people, uh, but both of them have been doing very well uh, at PMQs uh, and now making the difference uh, and showing what we're going to do in government. Yeah, and th that's uh, obviously uh, something that Oliver Dowden tried to bring in about, you know, Labour's record on, on various issues. Mm -hmm. um, but it didn't seem to fire up the back benches. There were one or two sort of half-hearted cheers, but he wasn't getting the crowd going, was he? I, I think he did really well to reference a couple of times the point that we do have now the best literacy rates yes. in the Western world, and that was raised by a couple of opposition MPs and, uh, and on the Conservative side. Um, so uh, that was a good substantive point. That actually people out there care about. You know, too often in Parliament we talk about things that Parliament and uh, uh, those in politics are interested in, but actually people out there are far more interested in whether their children are getting good education at school. And um, that is a good record, and that did, I, I think, uh, get the support of people on my side of the house. Yeah. Um, what about this, this issue, though, about the whole COVID inquiry and people wanting answers and to learn lessons? Um, what's your personal response to this judicial review mm. being put in place? Because many people have said, really, in, in terms of, of striking a chord with the public, it's not a good thing to have done. Well, it's absolutely right that there's an inquiry. It's absolutely right that we learn some significant lessons out the back of this, because many things were done that shouldn't have been done in hindsight. Hindsight being a wonderful thing, of course. But um, on this, I really do press the point that it's perfectly normal in uh, a whole host of inquiries, as I said, Chilcott, Butler, Hutt, Hutton, all sorts of inquiries under Tony Blair's time, this is not a million years ago, that the lawyers should discuss things between themselves and agree what is relevant and what isn't. And the current inquiry position is that everything should be released to the inquiry, which risks breaking that confidence that does occur in government, quite rightly. But then that indicates that the government does not have confidence in Baroness Hallett. And she has made the point, it is up to me to decide what is relevant. I need all the material, then I can decide what we accept and what we reject. Well, I don't speak for the government anymore, so no, I no, don't no, know whether the government are, has confidence or not. But you you the, are party to uh, the discussions uh, that will be going uh, on at a fairly senior level. Certainly what, it, certainly what is true is that most inquiries uh, do accept that there should be discussions between the inquiry and the government's lawyers, um, and those uh, lawyers then can be trusted to go through all sorts of documentation, just as they did under Tony Blair's time, to go through what is relevant and what isn't. And that seems to not be occurring this time. So th that is why it's now for the independent judicial system, uh, ironically, to decide whether the independent inquiry uh, should, should have access to everything or not. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the issue as well is that people will be asking, well, well hold on, the government asked Baroness Hallett to actually take this on and gave her the remit, and now they're trying to say, actually, no. we don't think you've got the remit. I mean, does this give it a, an open goal for Labour? Well, it's not an open call for Labour. I, I think it's a disgrace that the government has put this in, uh, asked Baroness Allah to do this uh, important piece of work, uh, and now, now strifling her uh, with the data that she needs. Uh, I think what they should do is, as uh, Reinhold has already said, is get the lawyers getting working together and see how... Going to... Running off to the courts isn't going to help us. It's going to cost us more money and not have... leave a bad taste in the mouth for the inquiry and the government. So let's do it properly, let's get but, together and finish but, this. But the challenge here is that Baroness Hallett has said she's not willing to even have those discussions. So I really hope, uh, I think, uh, I hope Khalid's right, that we can have those discussions. Mm. That's the right way to do this. Um, but it requires both sides to want to do it. Um, 
What will the legal bill be? Do we know yet <laughs> what it's likely to cost? Because, I mean, that could come back and bite again the government. Couldn't For it? sure. I mean, the only people that benefit from these things are the lawyers. Yeah. Um, uh, as we're seeing perhaps in hacking trials or, or illegal um, yeah. communications trials yeah. uh, or, or, or hearings. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just wondering um, how uh, the, the troops are feeling at the moment. I mean, you've mm. got the Prime Minister on the international stage. He's meeting the President, uh, talks about trade deals. Um, you've got Ukraine. Uh, in a, a very perilous position. James Cleverley's on the international, uh, international stage. Is there a worry that there are so many distractions for the government that it can't connect with issues back at home? So the Prime Minister has, as everyone now knows, uh, five priorities, and those have been clearly landed. We're all wishing him well in delivering them. But what a lot of parliamentarians are now looking for is a bit more vision as to what comes next. Where do we take this country through to the election and hopefully beyond? And um, you'll have seen uh, all sorts of suggestions from colleagues in the Considered Growth Group and beyond saying that we do need to perhaps look at the burden of tax on uh, people across this country. We do need to look at the ways that we're going to reform some of our public services, we need to build houses, and those are the things I think we need to now begin to pivot to as we head towards an election. And is that a discussion or is that a, a matter of real battle within the various elements of the Tory party now? Is, is there a fissure between particularly the right of the party and, and the way that things want to go on tax and so on? No, no, ultimately um, we are one team and the Prime Minister himself says that he would like to cut taxes, so we wish him well in delivering yeah. that. And, I, you know, I really do think also, Jeremy Hunt demonstrated in getting rid of the doctor's tax, the lifetime allowance on pensions, yeah. which the Labour Party would put in, which would penalise doctors, that we are serious about doing it. Yeah. Interesting that Angela Rayner then brought up, uh, again, the economy, the OECD figures, of course, um, and th there was a, a complete silence when um, Oliver Dowden came back um, <laughs> saying, well, you know, OECD showing... Because they're only indicating 0.3% growth. It's just economy. hardly any growth at all. Uh, and I think this is why the Prime Minister needs to be in-country looking at the real issues. What he's trying to do is trying to fight the Brexit deal, uh, which they've missed three years off. They well, haven't got any trade, trade deals trade with the deal sorted out. Mm. So he's trying to do that and he's forgetting what's going on. We've got doctors on strike. We've got the train workers back on strike again. Uh, we've got teachers not happy Heathrow, with what's going on. Uh, security Heathrow, stuff, and yeah. all of that's still coming up on our doorsteps. That's what people in the UK want to know. Uh, that's people living on our daily cities in my constituency right. want to know what's going to happen to them. That's what we need to get off. And he's not concentrating on that at the moment. Are you surprised that Angela Rayner did not go with, do you believe the country is at rock bottom, as the prince has asserted in the trial? I mean, that might have been quite a useful line to have gone in on as well. Well, no, I, th I think the prince is, for somebody who didn't want to be in the press, doing quite a lot to stand, say, <laughs> keep themselves in the press. Yeah. So I think we'll take no advice from the prince. OK. And, and <laughs> what was the reaction when that came out in, in the hearing yesterday, in terms of uh, the, the, the sort of Tory view of... The royals commenting on political matters. Well, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan uh, of the royal family and the monarchy, um, but I think uh, the Duke of Sussex has made his bed. Yeah. And? You think he's going to have to lie on it in terms of this hearing that's going on at the moment? I, I, I'm not going to opine on what courts might uh, come up with, uh, but... Oh, so, no, I mean, there's no, there's yeah, no jury yeah, involved. Yeah, it's not yeah, a criminal yeah, trial. No, it's no, a judge no, that no, decides... Judges, that yeah, I, I don't know what a judge is going to decide, but... Um, so, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but certainly um, uh, Prince Harry has made his decision as to the way he wants to approach these things. And I would have uh, I assumed that you do not believe that the country is at rock bottom at the moment? Uh, certainly not. Uh, I think the fact that the strikes are the thing that the Labour Party points to right now shows what would happen under a Labour government. This country would be beholden to Con the union contrary, contrary to that, the Labour Party would actually be working with the trade unions and avoiding these sort of strikes. That's well, the whole principle. Giving them all the money that they demand? No, no, exactly. no, no. What we've got to look at is not about giving money. It's about the terms and conditions they work under, how we work with them, how we support them, and how we set the future direction. So what we can say is this is what we can offer at the moment, and we will continue to do this on a regular basis. The reason why the strikes are going on is because the long overdue uh, pay terms and conditions have not been met for a long time under this government. Right. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your time. Uh, much appreciated. Thanks for joining us. Uh, indeed, we are going to be back in that High Court for Prince Harry. Has he reached rock bottom in that cross-questioning? Uh, that's coming up in a moment. Stay with us.
First and foremost, I am a GB News fan and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching and more humid. And welcome back to GB News Live. Now, thousands of people have had to uh, flee their flooded homes in the Kherson region of Ukraine after that destruction of the dam yesterday. And mass evacuations continuing elsewhere, uh, with the water levels rising further. We're well, both Ukraine and Russia accusing each other of destroying the dam. But uh, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak saying the attack on the dam would be a new low if shown to be the work of Russian forces. Well, our home security editor Mark White has the latest for us. In towns and villages along the Dnipro Valley, downstream from the Kokovka Dam, this is a rapidly evolving catastrophe. More than 80 towns and villages in the direct path of the floodwaters are already being inundated. It is a race to reach the most vulnerable, trapped by the rising waters. Boats and high-sided vehicles have been commandeered to try to reach those affected. Overnight, many people have moved to the top floors of their houses and even onto the roofs to escape the rising water. But even those elevated positions are far from safe, with whole structures being lifted up and washed downstream. And as bad as the situation is now, structural engineers are warning it's likely to get far worse in the days ahead. The dam, already breached and weakened, will continue to deteriorate, with more of the dam wall likely to give way, sending even more flood water cascading down the Dnipro River Valley. Perhaps, predictably, both sides are blaming each other for this man-made disaster. The Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, said he was in no doubt this massive explosion caught on a CCTV camera was the result of a Russian detonated mine within the dam. Russia, for its part, is blaming Ukrainian artillery and missile fire for the breach. Both the UK and US governments are leaning towards Russian involvement in the explosion but say they are still gathering and assessing all of the available intelligence. In the meantime, the priority is, of course, on the rescue efforts for an unfolding disaster that's being felt more widely than just by the area's human population. In the Ukrainian-held city of Kherson, almost all of the animals within the local zoo have drowned. And elsewhere, along with the rescue of people, Volunteers have been bringing pets and farm animals to safety. All of these rescue efforts are being hampered by the fact this is still an active war zone, 
with sadly no pause in the fighting. Russia accusing Ukraine of launching drone strikes on the flooded Russian-held town of Kakovka, and Ukraine accusing Russia of shelling flooded areas around the city of Kherson. Mark White, GB News. Let's get more with Mark, who's joining us uh, now in the studio. And Mark, I know there are reports, particularly the Kherson region, they, they hope that the water levels will actually peak later today, but there could be a further problem literally coming down river because of the dam itself. Yes, I mean, that, that's the next big issue. The structural engineers have been examining the, the dam and what's left of it. Um, the eastern portion of that dam is almost completely obliterated. Uh, the remaining portion, sections of the dam, are severely weakened and they believe that the, the structural integrity of that uh, walled dam area could go at any time. There's uh, obviously a lot of water left, pressure yeah. behind it. Yeah. Uh, and if that happens, then there's going to be much more in the way of water cascading down the Dnipro Valley. And, and President Zelensky indicating as well it's not just this issue of the flooding, which we can see in these uh, pictures as, as this is the breach in, in the dam. It's all this drinking water that's then being lost as well or polluted with uh, a, a suggestion of hundreds of litres of, of engine oil actually being in the water as well. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing that's the head-scratcher in terms of actually who stands to gain from the destruction of this dam because as much as it's clearly going to affect uh, Ukrainian-held cities and towns mm. in that area, it's also going to have a, a, a fairly devastating effect on Russian-held territory, including uh, down in the Crimea itself. They rely on that da dam and the reservoir for their drinking water. And that's where Russian troops are at the moment. I mean, clearly Ukraine's trying to regain that territory, but it will be Russian speaking areas or Russian troops and, and Russian forces who will be also directly affected by this. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and also Russian positions. There are Russian positions and Ukrainian positions down the river uh, in the Dnipro Valley that are now being inundated with flood water. We saw yesterday some startling images of mines that had been yes, buried, of yeah. course, just under the surface. Yeah. But the, the strength of that water cascading down is washing off the surface surface mud, uh, the, the mines are floating up and then detonating. Yeah. Uh, and clearly that's a danger. But the flood water itself is a danger. And, you know, the, the military is involved in a, an ongoing war, but they're having to divert from that to help save lives, along with the civilian emergency services and volunteers. But, uh, you know, just to pick up on, on the end of your report, they're the latest reports of shelling from the Russian side as those military uh, Ukrainian forces and, and civilian uh, groups try to get people to safety and, and, and move them away. Well, you would have thought, given this unfolding catastrophe, that in this area, at least, there could be some kind of unofficial ceasefire. ceasefire. Yeah. It doesn't seem that that's working. Mm. As I say, the Russians accusing the Ukrainians of drone strikes on that town of Kakovka that gives its name to the dam. Yeah. Uh, and then also on the other side, especially around Kherson, the Ukrainians accusing Russia of shelling that area. Now, the, the other aspect, um, and we remember what happened to grain prices in the international market after the uh, original um, incursion by, by the Russians into these areas of Ukraine. I mean, clearly you've got two problems now, huge areas of agricultural land flooded and, of course, the water source to keep other areas um, watered and, and uh, the, the crops being grown elsewhere being reduced rapidly. So that there's a, a double whammy, if you like, in terms of the economy. Yes, and you've a reduced crop anyway uh, in terms of what the farmers are able to get out into the fields and grow and collect because of the fact that a lot of farmland is actually on the front line at the moment. Uh, and then you've got the added problem of getting getting the, the grains and alike out of the ports yeah. that are under siege. Now, there, there has been agreement between Ukraine and, and Russia to allow shipments out there. But as you say, yes, the fact that this massive uh, inland sea it really is, you know, the size of the Great Lakes uh, up in North America, um, stretching back hundreds of miles and 
clearly very important for the agricultural land around that area is being targeted in this way. Yeah. You've got the flooded lands, you've got the lands that may be uh, in the months ahead then suffering from drought because the reservoir level dips. And, of course, the, the whole impact then on, on the international food prices. Um, now, t talking about North America, the Great Lakes, of course, we've got Rishi Sunak in Washington meeting the president. Where are we on this international blame game on who is responsible and then what measures should be taken as a result of that? Well, this is interesting because clearly President Zelensky has said that he is mm -hmm. absolutely in no doubt that this was... Um, Russian explosives, mines within the dam itself mm. that caused that huge explosion. The Russians, for their part, of course, saying that it was Russian, it was Ukrainian shelling and missiles. Interestingly, neither the US and the UK are coming out equivocally at this stage, uh, or unequivocally at this stage, yeah, yeah. and saying that this is... Uh, Russia. They are leaning towards Russia, of course, uh, but they say they're still assessing the intelligence that's been gathered from that uh, region. Uh, but you were making the very important point yesterday that in terms of, of any kind of military consideration, there was a road on the top of the dam, which was the only viable link between the two sides of the river, to get any kind of military force across if you're uh, mounting a counter-offensive. So in that sense, it, it would you know, explain why it was blown up. There's a road and a rail link. Right. And the, the, the fact is that the Ukrainian armed forces don't have air superiority. They don't have the heavy lift helicopters, which couldn't operate in that environment anyway. So if they want to move uh, men, women and armour, uh, particularly heavy armour, they've got no choice but to do it over roads. Yeah. And then when you come up against a natural barrier like the mighty uh, uh, Dnipro River... Which is now even wider, of course, which, because of the flooding. Course, yeah. 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 Then you need the crossing point. And if they take away... I mean, it's a, a well-established military tactic mm. for any side, either advancing or retreating. They blow the bridges or secure the bridges. If you're advancing, you secure the bridge. If you're retreating and you want to stop an advance, you blow the bridge. So it could well be a sound military tactic in that sense, despite uh, the terrible destruction that's now being caused. Yeah. Uh, but, as I say, both sides denying any responsibility at this stage. Mark, for the moment, thank you for that. We'll see what the reaction is in Washington, of course, and we'll keep people updated with the situation there on, well, I say on the ground, but in the floods, effectively. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Prince Harry, of course, at the High Court once again, giving his final testimony uh, in the hearing, a cross-examination today against Mirror Group newspapers. Um, he's accused them of uh, hacking voicemails when he was a teenager, saying he believes stories written in their publications causing security concerns, damaging his relationships, and that journalists, of course, to that phrase, had blood on their hands. Well, let's get more with our royal correspondent, Cameron Walker, who's been following this morning's testimony uh, at the High Court. And uh, I gather a certain spearmint rhino laptop, uh, laptop dancing club has, uh, has come into Fay uh, this morning. Yeah, a number of quite uncomfortable stories, actually, for Prince Harry this morning. I think more than yesterday, actually, because it, a lot of the articles refer to him and his relationship with former girlfriend Chelsea Davy. And I think he is visibly quite uh, uncomfortable, or at least hurt, by the articles that were written, which uh, corresponds to actually what he, he has written in his witness statements, which was released yesterday. These highly personal stories being in the public eye and him disagreeing that it's in the public interest for journalists to write about them. But nonetheless, this is uh, him complaining that there was alleged unlawful information going on at Mirror Group newspaper articles between 1996 and 2010. Now, one of the final articles which uh, he has been questioned on this morning as part of the cross-examination by uh, Mr Andrew Green, rep the barrister representing Mirror Group newspapers, is one about after his relationship with Chelsea ended and his attempts to win her back by bombarding her with telephone calls. Now, uh, uh, this is after Chelsea Davy already had a new partner and Miss Davy was at university at the time. Now, the barrister representing Mirror Group newspapers um, asked Prince Harry, are you aware that people close to Miss Davy were disclosing information to the media at the time? Prince Harry said he, dily, he highly doubted that was the case. Now, Mirror Group newspaper barrister presented Prince Harry with an internal email from Mirror Group newspapers 
between Mirror Group and a source, uh, a Mr. S uh, and to the journalist, Mr. Seville of the Sunday Mirror. Now, he makes the point that while it's unappealing and perhaps maybe intrusive that this source was trying to probe information out of Chelsea or the friends of Chelsea, uh, Mr. Green was putting it to Prince Harry that actually, unfortunately, friends surrounding Miss Davy were prepared and trying to pass information to the media. And there was nothing unlawful about this type of inf information gathering without getting into debate about uh, media ethics. Prince Harry responded by saying it was just one person, one of her friends, which did that. He also questioned the validity of this particular source and said he can't be sure that it is legitimate. Mirror Group newspaper's barrister said, do you think, therefore, it was a false email? And Harry says he can't be sure, but yes, he does think that it was a false email that has been presented to him in this case. Uh, and Mr uh, Green asked Prince Harry, would you accept that press can get this information without hacking or by using other unlawful means? And Prince Harry said he can't speculate. Um, I think what we're getting a sense of in, in these final few articles which are going through is, is Prince Harry's suspicions that uh, unlawful information gathering was taking place at these publications and was being authorised by the journalists who have written these articles, particularly about his relationship with Chelsea Davy, whereas the barrister for the Mirror Group newspapers are point, is pointing out a number of examples where previous articles by different media publications, such as the News of the World, such as the Daily Mail or the Mail on Sunday, had already disclosed this information to the public. And the other issue for Prince Harry seems to be today that there are other sources, regardless whether it's ethical or not, but it's simply not unlawful for friends of Chelsea Davy to speak to the media and um, to try and get information uh, ab about Mr Davy to the uh, journalists. So that seems to be the issue for Prince Harry, but the case does continue. Yeah, and of course, a recurring theme in, in terms of the uh, uh, cross-examination from Mr Green, which we'll likely see more of this afternoon. For the moment, Cameron, thank you very much indeed for that. Back, of course, to that court hearing uh, throughout the afternoon. Also coming up, should non-Welsh actors play Welsh characters? Michael Sheen thinks they're being no good boyos if they do. More on that in a moment. Stay with us. I'm Alex Deakin. This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. More of the same today, but there are signs of a change on the horizon. For today, though, it's a fine and sunny one for the vast majority. Again, the eastern side of the country likely to stay fairly cloudy. Grass pollen and UV levels very high in some locations, and the pressure is high. This high pressure has been giving us the fine weather for quite some time now, but still bringing in the cloud overnight, and it's been another drab start to the day. That cloud is slowly breaking up, but parts of the east coast are going to stay pretty grey again. Northern Scotland also staying fairly cloudy, but through the central belt and most other areas, if it isn't already sunny, it will turn sunny and temperatures responding to that sunshine getting over 20 Celsius, whereas again on that east coast, particularly with a nagging wind across East Anglia, temperatures really struggling in the low teens. Through this evening, again, most places fine and uh, pleasantly warm, but then the cloud just spills back in once more overnight. Uh, a repeat scenario where it stays clearest in the west. Temperatures again dropping down to single figures. Most places start Thursday at 8 to 10 Celsius. Most will start dry, but the cloud could be thick enough over the East Midlands, parts of eastern England for a little bit of drizzle here and there for a time in the morning. That should peter out. And again, the cloud will break up. Uh, a sunny start for West Wales, South West England and elsewhere. Many places seeing that cloud breaking up. But again, parts of the east may stay fairly glum, perhaps a bit brighter across parts of East Anglia with temperatures maybe a smidge higher. But again, coolest in the east, warmest in the west. Temperatures getting into the low 20s, 23, 24, maybe a 25 Celsius in South Wales. But signs of a change as the sunshine turns increasingly hazy with high clouds spilling in from the southwest. And yes, that is some rain, uh, just not far away from the southwest. It's going to push northwards heavy thundery showers during the weekend, but as well as an increasing risk of some heavy showers, it's going to be turning hotter and more humid. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. 
People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, yeah. suffering on a scale right. completely unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. The Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. It's one o'clock. A very good afternoon. You're with GB News Live. I'm Mark Longhurst, and coming up for you this Tuesday lunchtime, hooray Harry dumped and visits Spearmint Rhino nightclub. The latest headlines to be pulled apart in Prince Harry's High Court hearing, focusing today on his relationship with Chelsea Davy. We'll have the latest from court. At least half a million hectares of land in southern Ukraine could become desert. 42,000 people at risk from flooding after the destruction of the dam. Waters expected to peak later today. We'll have the latest from the scene in what's been described as a huge environmental and natural disaster. Sunak's stateside, the Prime Minister in Washington to reaffirm the so-called special relationship with his US counterpart. Topics thought to be on the table when the meters, leaders, leaders meet even. The threat of AI, the actions of Putin and, of course, the rise of China. And is he a no-good boyo or just acting up? Why, Welsh actor Michael Sheen says only Welsh actors should play Welsh parts. A part, of course, from David Frost, Tony Blair and Brian Clough. Tidy. First, the latest headlines with Aaron. Good afternoon to you. It is two minutes past one. Aaron Armstrong here in the GB newsroom. Now, the Duke of Sussex is continuing to give evidence in his high court phone hacking claim against Mirror Group newspapers. Uh, he is suing MGN for damages, claiming the group hacked his voicemails and that he and other members of his family were victims of unlawful information gathering, which the publisher denies. Uh, Harry has told the court uh, alleged phone hacking by journalists was a risk worth the reward and claims evidence of wrongdoing has been destroyed. 
The Deputy Prime Minister and his Labour counterpart have clashed in PMQs this afternoon over the COVID inquiry. Angela Rayner has suggested the government is abusing the judicial review. Oliver Dowden, though, defended their action, saying the Cabinet Office has handed over 55,000 documents so far. The Deputy Labour leader also condemned the £21 billion worth of public money lost in fraud since the pandemic began, saying it could happen again if the government refused to learn from their lessons. If this government can't get the public money back, they can't be trusted with anything else. Yeah. It's become a pattern of behaviour from the Conservatives. An inquiry missing the evidence, schools missing their pupils, taxpayers missing their money and ministers missing in action. Yeah. And all the while, working people pay the price for their mistakes. What's the right honourable lady doing? receiving £10,000 from Just Stop Oil backers, backing protesters, blocking new production and forcing us to import more foreign oil and gas. I find myself in agreement with the GMB union. What did they say? It's naive, lacks intellectual rigour and could decimate communities. The head of the UN's aid programme has warned of grave and far-reaching consequences for southern Ukraine following the collapse of a dam yesterday. Martin Griffiths says people face losing their homes, food and livelihoods. Tens of thousands of people have been evacuated in and around Russian-controlled Kherson, with rising water levels expected to peak later today. Ukraine and Russia are still accusing each other of uh, blowing up the Nova Kakovka Dam in an act of wartime sabotage. It comes as Ukraine's Deputy Defence Minister says Ukraine's counter-offensive has made advances up to a kilometre in the last 24 hours near the eastern city of Bakhmut. This body cam footage from the 3rd Assault Brigade shows Ukrainian forces making gains. Russia denies those claims, though, with their Defence Minister saying attempts at an offensive were thwarted. None of these claims have been independently verified. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister's arrived in Washington ahead of his fourth meeting with the US President, which will take place tomorrow. Rishi Sunak is expected to reaffirm Western support for Ukraine when he speaks to Joe Biden, in addition to addressing the growing threat of China, climate change and artificial intelligence. Thousands of holidaymakers could be affected by a fresh wave of strikes at Heathrow Airport this summer. As security guards there have announced the latest dates of their walkout. More than 2,000 Unite members will go on strike for 31 days between the 24th of June and the 27th of August, uh, which covers most of the weekends. It covers the start of the school holidays as well as the August bank holiday. Offers Officers from both Terminals 3 and 5 will take industrial action for the first time. The Union General Secretary Sharon Graham says the airport has got its priorities wrong and strikes will continue until a fair pay offer is made. The Met Police uh, says the force will apologise to anyone wrongly arrested during the King's coronation. Officers have been accused of heavy-handedness during the event, which uh, resulted in 62 arrests. Six members of the anti-monarchy group Republic were held for 16 hours before being released without charge and volunteers for Westminster Council Safety Scheme were also detained. Assistant Commissioner Louise Rolfe told the London Assembly Police and Crime Committee she trusts her officers acted to ensure the safety of the event. We want to understand the detail of what happened and those, those individual arrests and the circumstances surrounding them um, will be fully explored in our debrief process. And we will, you know, if we've got things wrong, we will apologise to individuals affected and we'll work through that. Pope Francis has given his last general audience at the Vatican before having surgery on his abdomen this afternoon. The Vatican says his medical team decided it was required because of a hernia. He will be in hospital for several days. The 86-year-old has suffered a number of ailments recently. He spent five days in hospital in March because of bronchitis. Two years ago, he had surgery on his large intestine. This is GB News. More as it happens. Now, back to Mark.
Aaron, thanks very much indeed, and welcome back to GB News Live. Let's just update you with some breaking news we're getting from Downing Street on the situation in Ukraine. Uh, number 10 spokesman has just been speaking to reporters, uh, saying that uh, the UK will divert uh, aid to the area affected by the destruction of the dam there uh, in Ukraine. Uh, Prime Minister spokesman is saying that there's a lot of humanitarian aid uh, being provided, uh, working closely with the UN and the Red Cross, but that aid is now being diverted to the area to assist those those who've had to leave their homes, said the spokesman, going on to say, our intelligence community is currently looking at the incident. It's too soon to make a definitive judgment, but we're clear that if it is indeed an intentional act, it shows blatant disregard for the lives of the thousands of people in that local area. So that's just being issued uh, from number 10. We'll get more reaction as it comes uh, through. But let's uh, also return now to uh, Prince Harry at the High Court. Uh, giving his final testimony in that hearing against Mirror Group uh, newspapers. In fact, we're being told that his cross-examination uh, has ended uh, under Andrew Green, KC, for the Mirror Group, uh, but that his own lawyer, uh, David Sherborne, will be um, speaking to him once more this afternoon. There is a break for lunch now. But Prince Harry, of course, uh, accusing the paper group of hacking voicemails when he was a teenager, saying he believes stories written in their publications caused security concerns damaged his relationships, particularly with former girlfriend Chelsea Davey, and that journalists, uh, to quote his phrase, had blood on their hands. Well, the cross-examination has been focusing uh, on stories about uh, Chelsea Davey and the effect it's had on their relationship. Let's get more now with Michael Cole, royal commentator and former royal correspondent, of course, uh, who followed many of these events uh, at the time, joining us in the studio. Uh, Michael, thank you. I suspect maybe... Uh, the Prince, uh, with a sigh of relief, um, has finished the cross-examination. It's been pretty thorough, though, in terms of testing uh, assertion as opposed to fact. Was there anything substantiated in terms of the, the, the voicemails or the hacking that went uh, allegedly on? I didn't put a stopwatch on it, but I think we've had almost nine yeah. hours of him being cross-examined by Andrew Green, the counsel for Mirror Group newspapers, and we've gone through 33 instances of alleged illicit information gathering. Over a 15-year period. As Over well, a 15-year yeah. period. This is between 12 and 26 years ago, so let's put it into context when he was quite a, a, a young man. And you and I and Cameron uh, have been going through all the testimony as it's come out. We've read it thoroughly. I've been looking for the smoking gun, and I have to say there's not any smoking gun, and there's actually no gun, as far as I can see, because obviously he has suspicions, he has beliefs, he has certainly a degree of anger, and one can understand that uh, a young man with his girlfriend having details of their relationship published must have been extremely annoying. I think we could all say that we would have shared that annoyance had it been us. Yeah. But suspicion is not proof. Uh, assertion is not evidence. And in this case, which is a civil case brought by... Uh, Prince Harry as the principal plaintiff, there are others, but he's the principal one, is about proof and it's about evidence and it will be decided by the judge, Mr Justice well, Fancourt, yeah. on the basis of evidence. Well, um, yeah, and, and let's just reflect to, to, to remind people that this is not a criminal trial where it's um, basically uh, in terms of... Uh, that balance the, of... Per, per, the, but, yeah, this, this is the judge deciding himself on the balance of... of probability, rather than the jury deciding beyond reasonable doubt. So I guess there is a bit more leeway mm -hmm. in terms of a civil case. But I'm just looking at the, the process that uh, led up to this, because David Sherborne, uh, the Prince's lawyer, will be going through some more material this afternoon. But Prince Harry said he'd not sought legal advice on whether he had a valid claim until he, the phrase being, bumped into David Sherborne... In France. ..in France in 2018. Now, this is interesting. Mm. <laughs> why did he suddenly bump, into, <laughs> bump him. into him and why did he suddenly decide to take action then? Uh, of course, uh, he'd been newly married then, I think that's right. I'm just trying to get it into... Or was he just about to be married in 2018? Yeah, well, another interesting point. He's told the court, uh, even if he'd seen the articles before this, he would not have been allowed to make a claim, quote, it was all contained within the palace mm. and even if I wanted to, I wouldn't be allowed to make a claim. Well, certainly, there is a very good... There's no 
constitutional... Never, never complain, never explain. <laughs> no, yeah, well, yeah. let's not like that. There is nothing in our brilliantly unwritten constitution which says that the royal prince cannot go into the witness box. Uh, but it's very rarely done, and having lived through these two days, we can see the reasons why it's rarely done, mm. because it's not terribly effective. And it would be certainly the policy... Uh, you know, we don't want members of the royal family appearing in the Queen's courts, now the King's courts, uh, with King's counsel... Uh, a casey questioning, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, indeed, in front of judges appointed mm. by the Crown. Mm. So we want to keep Crown and State and Executive uh, separate as far as possible. But and guess... they are the royal courts of justice, yeah, don't I forget. guess the other issue, though, as, of course, we, we understand his father has uh, tried, tried to... Um, advise him, everything comes out in court. So the good and the bad is put on public display. Well, when you're being cross-examined, you're not in control. And uh, the cross-examination has gone to places he didn't want to go to mm. over his wearing the Nazi uniform or the word Nazi... Visiting Nazi. Spearmint Rhino Lap Dancing Club. And, and, and all that. We didn't yep. get into Las Vegas, but we've gone into most other things that, w that, that, that disappeared in his young life and, and taking drugs, mm. uh, and which must have been extremely uncomfortable for him, uh, which, of course has ramifications with his uh, residency yeah. in America where they don't like people coming in who've actually uh, been convicted... Well, and we understand that, that there are questions being addressed uh, on that Absolutely. in the United States Absolutely. at the moment. But it's been fascinating yeah. and, I think, uh, an interesting exercise. And now David Sherborne, uh, who's a bit of a show-business barrister, uh, well uh, reported upon, has his opportunity to re-examine uh, the prince and try to... Uh, perhaps add uh, a bit of light context. and shade. Yeah, yeah. Light and shade right. to actually bring out what he believes. Prince Harry is furious about this. He's irate. He's incandescent. He he feels his life has been ruined by the press. But what he hasn't got, as far as I can see from reading the testimony, is evidence that these people at Mirror Group newspapers, he's accusing them of being criminals. So the ammunition. Well, yeah. if you're going to accuse people of being criminals, yeah. you better come with the evidence. Yeah. OK, Michael, stay with us, but we can speak now to uh, Barrister Chris Dorcasey, who can join us. Uh, Chris, thank you for your time. Just on this particular issue, I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, the transcript of uh, this hearing just before it broke for lunch, um, and um, Andrew Green saying, uh, claims about industrial-scale destruction of evidence. You constantly refer to destruction of evidence. Where do you get this idea of destruction of evidence by the Mirror Group? My legal team, the prince responded. I mean, is that going to be enough to get the judge to start thinking about the balance of probability? Uh, well, listen, it's a matter ultimately for, for Mr Justice Fancourt to decide what, what the evidence proves or doesn't prove. But, um, you know, this isn't a jury case. So, as you pointed out, we're not risking contempt of court by commenting on the issues. And, mm. frankly, um, your, your previous contributor, I think, um, was spot on. Um, everything I've heard so far suggests that this is more of an exercise in sort of psychological therapy for Prince Harry than a realistic prospect of uh, successful legal action because uh, there's so much speculation in that which he has put before the court and he, he and you know, to, to just say well I got this from my lawyers I mean as you rightly point out that's not going to wash and um, and it's quite a risky thing to say because uh, ultimately what passes between client and lawyer is generally speaking protected as legal privilege but if you start to blurt out what what your lawyers have told you then potentially there could be a, a, a potential for that to come into the evidence so yeah. I think this whole process has the flavor of something other than a genuine and serious piece of litigation. So he just wants the, the whole issue aired, perhaps, in, in court. I'm just looking at, uh, again, from the transcript, what may be actually quite a, a pivotal uh, moment, um, with Andrew Green saying, you say you were hacked over a 15-year period. Yes, Prince Harry says. Are you claiming damages on the basis your phone was hacked on a daily basis? It could have been, said Prince Harry. I simply don't know, my lord. That's part of the reason why I'm here. Well, one might think actually part of the reason you'd go into court is that you do know and you've got the evidence to make it stick. 
Yes, I mean, the, the rest of us, of course, or most people who are watching your program won't have the money to be able to go on a sort of yep. exploration in the high court at vast expense. I mean, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of pounds in cost to get to where Prince Harry has got so far. And for all I know, it could be seven figures by the time it's over. Um, most of us don't have the opportunity to do that. He clearly does have the resources okay. um, to, to, to commit to this. Um, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, I, I mean, generally speaking, um, when you are considering a very expensive piece of litigation, you would already have evidence that would cross that threshold of the balance of probabilities before you issued the claim. Because otherwise, not only are you going to spend a huge amount of your own money in bringing the claim, but you're going to end up having to pay the costs of the other side, which will be equal, if not even greater right. than his own. OK, I'm going to put my hand in my pocket and I'm going to secure your services for this afternoon. I'm going to make you David Sherbourne uh, KC for the day. How are you going to approach this to get it back on track this afternoon? Well, I think I think the only way it gets back on track, and it's rather difficult to see how it could happen, is is with something more substantial in terms of evidence. So, if there can be at the moment, as you as you've alluded to, there've been lots of questions about articles, which it turns out were just rehashed articles from other newspapers, mm. or already in the public domain, so could easily have come to the Mirror journalists via that route rather than via hacking. Um, they're going to have to come up with something real and substantial to prove that some individual story in the mirror can be directly linked to a source which is not either in the public domain or could not have been via uh, one of Harry's friends or associates or employees or someone of that kind, which is, of course, the mirror's principal defence, that this wasn't hacking. It was just stories they were given by people about a high-profile individual in the way that celebrity and royal stories have been generated since time began. Yeah, and of course, let's just reflect that the Mirror at the very outset accepted there was one incident or one instance where phone hacking or, or intervention, illegal intervention, was actually acknowledged. Yeah, yes, indeed. Um, the, the, the Mirror did do that. Um, and, and one would imagine, again, I can't speak for the Mirror, but one would imagine if you were defending an action like this and you discovered that there was evidence that you your organisation, of course, people many years ago who are no longer in the organisation mm. had been involved in this kind of activity, you would save yourself the money and the, and, and the sort of publicity damage, if you like, of, of having all this played out in court, and you would just admit that. So um, they did admit that in respect, as you say, of one example, um, and I'm sure that there'll, be, there'll have to be some uh, recognition of that in damages in due course. Um, but, but all of this, it seems to me, and the flavour of Harry's evidence is much more emotional than legal. And right. courts of law are not places where people's emotions are supposed to play out, particularly not, um, as it were, for the entertainment of the public, which, which I suspect is about as much uh, as, be, as is being derived from this process so far. Yeah. Uh, on that note, Chris, thank you for that. Uh, you can send GB News your bill for that advice. Thanks very much indeed for joining us here. And, uh, of course, uh, a little more to come this afternoon. As we say, uh, we've got Mr Sherborne back uh, in uh, terms of uh, the defence, if you like. We'll update you. Uh, Michael's staying with us as well to give his assessment of that. But also coming up, we'll have the latest on Ukraine. Just to remind you, Downing Street saying that UK humanitarian aid is being diverted to the area affected by the burst dam. We'll be speaking live to a journalist uh, there on the spot. Stay with us. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. 
I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back to GB News Live. Let's just update you on this line we've got from Downing Street on Ukraine. Uh, the Prime Minister spokesman saying uh, the government will be uh, diverting humanitarian aid with the uh, assistance of the UN and the Red Cross to the area affected by the destruction of this dam. Uh, and Britain's intelligence community currently looking at the incident. Too soon to make a definitive judgment, said the spokesman. But we're clear if it's need, indeed an intentional act, it shows blatant disregard for the lives of thousands of people in that local area. Well, indeed, uh, many homes in the Kherson region of Ukraine have been uh, destroyed after the destruction of that dam yesterday. Mass evacuations continue uh, amid fears that water levels could rise further, although they are expected to stabilise a little later this afternoon. Ukraine and Russia accusing each other of blowing up the dam. But Rishi Sunak saying the attack on the dam will be a new low if shown to be the work of Russian forces. A home security editor, Mark White, has the latest for us. In towns and villages along the Dnipro Valley, downstream from the Kokovka Dam, this is a rapidly evolving catastrophe. More than 80 towns and villages in the direct path of the floodwaters are already being inundated. It is a race to reach the most vulnerable, trapped by the rising waters. Boats and high-sided vehicles have been commandeered to try to reach those affected. Overnight, many people have moved to the top floors of their houses and even onto the roofs to escape the rising water. But even those elevated positions are far from safe, with whole structures being lifted up and washed downstream. And as bad as the situation is now, structural engineers are warning it's likely to get far worse in the days ahead. The dam, already breached and weakened, will continue to deteriorate, with more of the dam wall likely to give way, sending even more flood water cascading down the Dnipro River Valley. Perhaps, predictably, both sides are blaming each other for this man-made disaster. The Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, said he was in no doubt this massive explosion caught on a CCTV camera was the result of a Russian detonated mine within the dam. Russia, for its part, is blaming Ukrainian artillery and missile fire for the breach. Both the UK and US governments are leaning towards Russian involvement in the explosion but say they are still gathering and assessing all of the available intelligence. 
In the meantime, the priority is, of course, on the rescue efforts for an unfolding disaster that's being felt more widely than just by the area's human population. In the Ukrainian-held city of Kherson, almost all of the animals within the local zoo have drowned. And elsewhere, along with the rescue of people, volunteers have been bringing pets and farm animals to safety. All of these rescue efforts are being hampered by the fact this is still an active war zone, with sadly no pause in the fighting. Russia accusing Ukraine of launching drone strikes on the flooded Russian-held town of Kakovka, and Ukraine accusing Russia of shelling flooded areas around the city of Kherson. Mark White, GB News. Well, let's get the very latest now in Ukraine. And joining us from the Kherson region is journalist Mircea Babu, who is there for us. Uh, Mircea, thank you for your time. Uh, I gather some reports suggest there is a hope that the water levels may actually stabilise now this afternoon. Indeed, we're getting reports from the region that the situation might improve in the next hours. By evening, we should have... Uh, some sort of answers from specialists and the Ukrainian military who are monitoring the situation closely. But what we see here, and I'm standing in a bus station about 100, less than 100 kilometers from the most affected areas, uh, we see an influx of people, internal displaced refugees, people who fled the uh, regions that are now uh, affected and are reaching this bus station and then continuing their journey onwards to other parts of Ukraine or even abroad. I spoke with... Um, Several people in the last half an hour coming from Kherson, from the city and from uh, parts of the uh, from the Russian occupied areas. And what they're telling me is that the situation is, is terrible. It's worse. They lost everything. They're scared and they have no place to go at the moment. Yeah. And, and the numbers we're being told could be 40 to 50,000 or even more. Um, what, it, what is likely to be done to help them? I mean, are they being moved to friends and family elsewhere in Ukraine or, or are there centres being set up to, to help these people? Well, this is a, a developing story, so it, it changes uh, from hour to hour at the moment. What we see is a, a, some sort of an informal network, people helping each other, families, relatives, as, as you said are reaching out to the people affected and they're offering shelter, food, clothes, medicine, whatever they can. Um, we will see a response from the Ukrainian government and major NGOs in the areas. I have not seen myself any major tents or um, refugee centers in the place I'm currently standing, but I'm sure that's gonna happen in the next few hours, uh, probably by um, late tomorrow evening, the latest. Yes, indeed. That there's been an announcement here in London at, at Downing Street that UK humanitarian aid is, is being diverted uh, to this area in addition uh, with help from the UN and, and the Red Cross. But I gather the other aspect is there have been reports of shelling in the Kherson region. So as this environmental disaster unfolds and the humanitarian rescue takes place, we've still got the military battle going on. Absolutely, absolutely. And Kherson has been like this since it was liberated last fall. If you remember, we had shelling, constant shelling every day, and people lost their lives weekly in this region. So even if it's a liberated city under the Ukrainian army control, this is very much a disputed area and a very much an active uh, war zone. You can hear the shellings uh, every five or ten minutes. Uh, you can hear the artillery uh, in the region, and people are genuinely scared of both the military conflict, the active conflict, as well as the um, disaster unfolding yeah. in front of them. Uh, and what are the fears of that uh, worsening if the dam fails completely? I gather that as well as this breach, of course, with the explosion, uh, structure engineers are trying to establish how safe the rest of the structure is. Well, from what we see and what we uh, are getting in information, and obviously this is a developing story again, is that um, the dam is going to um, give in at one point. Sooner or later, it's just a matter of time. That can mean massive flooding in the area. That can mean Harrison, the city, altogether under the waters. Um, there's a plan, uh, I understand, from the Ukrainian army, from the Ukrainian authorities, to evacuate the whole city in the event that... Um, this will happen, the dam will, will give in, will collapse completely. But at the moment, everyone's hoping that uh, what the worst part has uh, passed, and now it's just dealing with the humanitarian aid and um, the unfolding sort of social situation of yes. this catastrophe.
Uh, and we've seen pictures, much of, of people being rescued, uh, of pets having been lost, uh, and, and youngsters and families moved, and, and, and the elderly moved as well. Um, what are the stories you're hearing and, and how people are coping with this, bearing all the other psychological trauma they've had to deal with? Well, they're, they're terrible stories, to be honest with you. Uh, people are genuinely affected by, by this. And um, keep in mind that they've been through war for the last year and a half. So uh, they were already affected to some extent by the ongoing conflict. Now they've lost their homes, they've lost everything they had, they owned, and some of them probably um, lost pets, lost, like you said, um, a, a, a lot of things. So they're yeah. visibly emotional, they're exhausted, um, they're scared, and they don't know what's going to happen next. Mircea, thank you once again for updating us uh, in the Kherson region and bringing us up to date. Much appreciated. Back to you, of course, uh, as we learn more. Thank you very much indeed. And, uh, of course, we'll keep you updated uh, on that changing position. Uh, but as Mircea was saying, uh, hopes that the waters at the moment will start to stabilise this afternoon. We'll have more for you uh, on that as the afternoon progresses. First, an update on all the news headlines with Aaron. Hi there, it is uh, 1.33 here in the GB newsroom. The Duke of Sussex says journalists at the Mirror Group newspapers went to extreme lengths to cover up phone hacking, which he claims took place on an industrial scale. Prince Harry's cross-examination concluded with him stating he believes the process of phone hacking began at the Mirror Group and evidence of it has been destroyed. He was questioned about 33 articles which form the basis of his claim for damages, which alleges journalists from MGN publications used unlawful techniques to get the story. The publisher denies wrongdoing. The head of the UN's aid programme has warned of grave and far-reaching consequences for southern Ukraine following the collapse of a dam yesterday. Martin Griffiths says people face losing their homes, food uh, and livelihoods. Tens of thousands of people have been evacuated in and around the Russian-controlled city of Kherson, with rising water levels expected to peak later today. Ukraine and Russia continue to accuse each other of exploding the Nova Kakovka Dam in an act of wartime sabotage. The Metropolitan Police says the force will apologise to anyone wrongly arrested during the King's coronation. Officers have been accused of heavy-handedness, during the event, which resulted in 62 arrests, six members of the anti-monarchy group Republic were held for 16 hours before being released without charge. And volunteers for Westminster County, County Council Safety Scheme were also detained. Uh, the Met says officers acted to ensure the safety of the event. Thousands of holidaymakers could be affected by a fresh wave of strikes at Heathrow Airport this summer. More than 2,000 security guards with the Union Unite have announced the dates of their latest walkout. 31 days will be affected between the 24th of June and the 27th of August, covering the start of the school holidays and the August bank holiday weekend. The Unite says the airport's priorities are wrong. And strikes will continue until a fair pay offer is made. More on those stories on our website, gbnews.com. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. And a quick look at today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2467 and €1.1634. The price of gold, £1,572.39 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,636 points. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for physical investment. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we 
get out of it. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion. Looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Britain's news channel. And welcome back to GB News Live. Uh, we're updating on Prime Minister's questions, which was Deputy Prime Minister's questions today, because Rishi Sunak is in Washington uh, seeking uh, an economic alliance uh, with the US to counter the rise of China, the risk of AI. Uh, he's also speaking to congressional and business leaders about more support uh, for Ukraine, with, of course, Number 10 having indicated in the past hour that they'll be sending more humanitarian aid to Ukraine because of the breach of that dam. Well, let's uh, actually uh, reflect that, uh, of course, uh, they are also speaking about trade uh, and uh, a suggestion that uh, they'll also be looking at uh, what the, uh, pr uh, the president has put in place in terms of help for uh, the uh, electric car industry in uh, the States and uh, other measures. But we can speak now to our deputy political editor, uh, Tom Harwood, who can join us. Um, I think we were trying to work out, is it the fourth meeting between the two of them? So, looking back at all of the different meetings, of course, there's been the G20 yeah. and the G7, where there have been conversations between the two of them. Also, President Biden, of course, came across to Northern Ireland. Uh, and they not had a cup of tea together. Ago. They had a cup yeah. of tea. Uh, and, indeed, uh, Rishi Sunak went across to California, to San Diego, for the launch of the yeah. AUKUS pact as well. So those were the formal meetings. Of course, there have been lots of phone calls as well. But in the relatively short period of time since Rishi Sunak has become Prime Minister, he has met Joe Biden a fair amount. And of course, the moment at which Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister, uh, Joe Biden decided to interrupt a press conference he was giving yes. to congratulate yeah. who he then described as Rashid Sanouk, yeah. but I think he's, he's learnt the we, name since we, we then. We know what he meant, yeah. Um, but but, but uh, this, this looks as like if it's, it's a biggie in terms of the amount that's on the agenda. There are oh. no other world leaders. This is a one-to-one, -one, uh, and we've got, you know, the special relationship, that phrase often used, but particular, you know, the military situation, the diplomatic situation, and the trade situation, too. Certainly, and that's why today and indeed tomorrow morning there are business leader meetings, uh, talking to people at the top of companies that have just announced investment of around $16 billion in the United Kingdom. Mm. Of course, we know uh, 1.5 million Brits work for American companies, 1.3 million Americans work for British companies. This is a very close relationship between these two countries that speak the same language, have many of the same customs, and, of course, Rishi Sunak is no stranger to that. He, 
himself lived in America and worked yeah. in California for quite some time. Had a green but, card, uh, remember. Indeed. Yeah. But today, it's the Hill. It's meeting the leaders of uh, congressional committees and, and, and the parties there. The tomorrow, of Washington. Indeed. Yeah. And tomorrow is the White House visit and the one-to-one -one bilateral with Joe Biden. Right. Um, just to sort of touch on a rather difficult uh, subject, though, um, clearly the United States has uh, uh, put massive amounts in terms of supporting industry, particularly electric car industries, mm -hmm. renewable industries and so on. Um, and Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, said, we're not going to go down that road. Mm. So what is the approach going to be? Is Rishi Sunak going to try to say to the Americans, I think you need to try and roll back a bit on this? Or is he saying, can you give us a little bit of help on various trade deals to sweeten the pill? Well, I think it's going to be more of the latter than the former. Of course, we should say that on his way over, on the flight over, uh, Rishi Sunak told journalists that there is no prospect of a, of a grand, all-encompassing free trade agreement being discussed Which here. Which is what That's maybe people something... thought at the time of Brexit. That was Which is what, and period. indeed, it's yeah. what Donald Trump uh, yeah. wanted to do, and that those conversations were had. But uh, I, this administration of the United States is less looking to it, and indeed Rishi Sunak is not wanting to uh, use so much bandwidth yeah. of, of Whitehall negotiating that either. The United Kingdom is doing some deals with states individually in terms yeah, of yeah. Uh, increasing trade. But yes, trying to uh, make sure that the United Kingdom is included in what some people in Washington, D.C. are calling friendshoring. Now, this is a bit of a, an interesting phrase. We've heard of onshoring, which is stopping jobs in China and bringing back to the United States. Right. Friendshoring is about making sure you trade with your allies more, not just returning those jobs to the United States, but perhaps deciding to buy things more from those countries like Japan, South Korea, or even the United Kingdom. Right, scotch whiskey and raincoats, maybe. <laughs> but, I mean, the other thing I guess that we ought to reflect on is that Biden will want these pictures to be seen as well, in terms of him uh, being active um, on the world stage mm -hmm. and, and perhaps not falling down on the job, to use a phrase. Well, it, it, it hasn't uh, escaped many people's notice that the presidential election for next mm. year does seem to have already got underway. We've saw, seen in the Republican camp, uh, Chris Christie, the former New Jersey governor, uh, declare just yesterday. Of course, we've seen uh, Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump already declare as well. Uh, that debate is all heating up. And of course, uh, Joe Biden is not necessarily facing a completely clear path to securing no. the Democratic nomination, although he has declared he is running. So, yes, I suppose these meetings do matter, but Rishi Sunak has these three big asks on his plate yeah. uh, and, and, and three big conversations, trade and investment, Ukraine, but also artificial intelligence. Yes, and, and of course, uh, the clock ticking, uh, we believe, uh, for many experts, saying that you know, within two years that it could be a direct threat to us. This was the, the infamous cup of tea, of course, uh, between the two. Not much being said, but um, mm. I guess that the other aspect is that Ukraine has changed now, and when we talk about Republicans and Democrats, clearly uh, that's going to be vital in terms of the approach in the years to come on aid to Ukraine, I guess the two men will be reassessing the situation after what's happened to this dam and, and the humanitarian aspect of it. Certainly, and these conversations do happen all the time, particularly within the G7, which of course is that group with the United Kingdom, yep. the United States, Canada, uh, Italy, uh, Japan, France and Germany. Mm. Got there in the end. Um, and this group has really been coordinating a lot of what we describe as the West's response yeah, yeah. to Ukraine. Many calls have been having at various ministerial levels within that group. And it does seem that actually it's the United States and the United Kingdom that have been pushing more, and, and, and indeed Canada, uh, that have been pushing more for uh, a stronger line. And sometimes it's been the Europeans who have been dragging uh, the, feet a, dragging bit, the yeah. feet a little bit on the military Particularly side. Particularly the Germans, so the, the, the sort of charge against them. Um, Tom, for the moment, thank you. We'll see will emerge from Washington, of course, a little later today, uh, and uh, if there are any communiques, of course. Now, actor Michael Sheen has hit out at non-Welsh actors playing Welsh roles, saying he finds it hard to accept actors who are not from the country in those roles, uh, knowing that's not the case. Well, it's despite having played uh, some roles as uh, Edinburgh-born Prime Minister Sir Tony Blair, uh, English broadcaster David Frost, um, and a, a certain, uh, of course, uh, football manager uh, in terms of uh, his... Uh, Canon, uh, uh, Brian Clough. Uh, but let's speak to someone else now who's in the crucible of uh, Welsh acting talent and Port Talbot, Theatre Comba 
is there. Um, you're in good company, of course. Richard Burton, Anthony Hopkins and now Michael Sheen. Um, what's the reaction been there to what he said? Well, interestingly, those names you've mentioned, I've heard a few of those a few times this morning, actually. Uh, many people around here have seen what's been circulating over the last uh, day or so, uh, Michael Sheen's comments about actors who aren't from this area. But many have pointed out, we've seen lots of Hollywood A-listers, or including people uh, from this country who've made it uh, into top movies, uh, using accents or playing uh, parts of people from different places where they're not from. Um, so interesting people saying it shouldn't really matter as long as they can act they can do a professional job and if they can do an accent even better but one lady was was keen to say that Americans haven't played good English accents those were her words but from the people here uh, does this matter or should it be a concern uh, what Michael Sheen said this is what they had to say no if, as long as there's talent and a good actor there's no problem for me as long as you're a pretty good actor uh, all right <laughs> don't so well, as you say, it uh, don't matter really. So. so no, I don't think it really matters. Not really. Well, as you heard from those people, a mixture of views. Uh, in response to this, Michael Sheen has tweeted saying a comment about having heard a lot of dodgy accents from non-Welsh uh, actors is not the end of the world. It's not about principle, it's about convincing and the money people not thinking Welsh actors can lead shows a lot um, of the time. So it's one of those things uh, people will be talking in and around this area. He's a well-known name. There is a film um, being uh, filmed here in this area at the moment uh, so lots of people are interested in that but whether or not a uh, Welsh accent or someone from outside of Wales playing a part uh, people here seem to say if you do a professional good a professional job that yeah. is good enough and he, he's also repeated a point he's made previously about the title of, of Prince of Wales uh, saying it's ridiculous and silly no reason why the title should continue but certainly with someone who's not Welsh. Uh, again, he's, um, he's returning to a familiar theme, it seems. He is, and he's not the only one. We heard some of these themes being uh, voiced by some actors some years ago, and over the years, it's not a new phenomenon. Uh, actors from different parts of the country and indeed the world play uh, accents or parts of people from different parts of the world. So it's one of those conversations which gets people going, but certainly from people here, they seem to say as long as someone can do the job and act professionally, that's good enough for them. Uh, Theo, thank you very much indeed for updating us uh, there and uh, bringing us the voice of Port Talbot. Thank you. Oh, dear. Now, uh, let's talk about the battle against the bulge. The Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, is saying that he wants the NHS to be at the forefront of dispensing a new cutting-edge weight loss drug. Well, the £40 million pilot aiming to tackle obesity, reduce NHS waiting list times and get people back to work. Well, the drug's only currently available in hospitals, but it can help patients to lose up to 15% of their body weight. Mr Barclay is saying increased access to those drugs could have a huge impact. Cancer, diabetes, uh, mental health, MSK. Uh, so obesity really is a big impact on the NHS. We think it costs around £6.5 billion pounds to the NHS. But it's about empowering patients. And we know, as I say, that it has a big impact on people's health if they're overweight. But people struggle to lose that weight and to keep that off. And this is a really exciting development. And we want to make sure the NHS is at the front of the queue in rolling it out. Well, let's uh, get some reaction now with uh, GP Dr Luke Presides, who can join us. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your time. Um, we, we should reflect, I guess, the drug will be in addition to all those other aspects of, uh, you know, a good diet and exercise. So it's, it's, it's not just uh, an either or. Thanks for having me on. Yes, absolutely. You're right. It's got to be part of what we call a holistic programme, which includes lifestyle change, good diet, physical activity is still key. And all of that together will help people maintain their weight loss even after they stop the medication. And, and is it literally just a, an appetite suppressant? And, and, you know, how healthy is that for us? So it works on a hormone called GLP-1 in the body. And the way that it works for weight is it reduces um, the speed at which the stomach empties into the rest of the bowel. So you end up feeling fuller for longer and satisfied with less. And that's how it helps people to intake less portions and, and keep weight 
down. OK, so I, I would guess that a GP involved would then have to make sure that, you know, there is still a balanced diet being uh, taken in because, of course, uh, if you stop eating various things, it, it could have a, another detrimental effect on your health. Yeah, important to make sure that you're still getting the vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and particularly protein that you need um, so that you can live a, live a healthy life, not just a slimmer life. Yeah, I guess the background is, though, that, you know, the, the increasing identity of, of um, various health problems with obesity and what that's actually doing to the NHS, having to deal with things like um, diabetes too, for instance. Yeah, and this is why this is so exciting. I would say it's rare that the NHS takes such a forward-looking view in that if people are able to lose weight over the next few years, assisted by having this medication, then the strain on resources of chronic illnesses like diabetes or big acute things like heart attacks or strokes, yeah. then that strain will be reduced and the spend will be reduced overall. Not to mention the amount of people that might be back in the workplace and not off sick as well. So I think there's lots of benefits and it's really good they're taking a more long-term view. OK. Is one of the difficulties, however, I understand that, you know, once you stop taking it, um, you could be back on uh, the, the, the sort of the weight coming back on. Yeah, so there is more and more evidence coming out that there's a portion of people that might need to be on this um, more long term to keep the right. weight off. I would say if you're able to develop new habits around um, a healthy lifestyle, diet and exercise, that kind of thing, and keep them, then you're more likely to maintain the majority of the weight off. And of course, the nice guidance at the moment, the national guidance is this will be offered for no more than two years. And, uh -huh. you know, that may not be enough for everybody. Yeah. OK. But uh, obviously, uh, it's, it's, as you say, exciting in terms of direct benefit to, to those who've got uh, various problems. Luke, thank you very much indeed for your time. Uh, and of course, uh, we'll monitor that uh, as it comes through. Uh, Steve Barclay indicating that uh, obviously it's going to be introduced fairly shortly. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, coming up, uh, we'll be back to uh, court for Prince Harry's... Uh, well, the cross-examination is finished, but his own lawyer will be asking him more questions. Uh, what could they be? We'll be updating you from outside the court. Stay with us here on GB News Live. I'm Alex Deakin. This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. More of the same today, but there are signs of a change on the horizon. For today, though, it's a fine and sunny one for the vast majority. Again, the eastern side of the country likely to stay fairly cloudy. Grass pollen and UV levels very high in some locations, and the pressure is high. This high pressure has been giving us the fine weather for quite some time now, but still bringing in the cloud overnight, and it's been another drab start to the day. That cloud is slowly breaking up, but parts of the east coast are going to stay pretty grey again. Northern Scotland also staying fairly cloudy, but through the central belt and most other areas, if it isn't already sunny, it will turn sunny and temperatures responding to that sunshine getting over 20 Celsius, whereas again on that east coast, particularly with a nagging wind across East Anglia, temperatures really struggling in the low teens. Through this evening, again, most places fine and uh, pleasantly warm, but then the cloud just spills back in once more overnight. Uh, a repeat scenario where it stays clearest in the west. Temperatures again dropping down to single figures. Most places start Thursday at 8 to 10 Celsius. Most will start dry, but the cloud could be thick enough over the East Midlands, parts of Eastern England for a little bit of drizzle here and there for a time in the morning. That should peter out. And again, the cloud will break up. Uh, a sunny start for West Wales, Southwest England and elsewhere. Many places seeing that cloud breaking up. But again, parts of the east may stay fairly glum, perhaps a bit brighter across parts of East Anglia with temperatures maybe a, a smidge higher. But again, coolest in the east, warmest in the west. Temperatures getting into the low 20s, 23, 24, maybe a 25 Celsius in South Wales. But signs of a change as the sunshine turns increasingly hazy with high clouds spilling in from the southwest. And yes, that is some rain, uh, just not far away from the southwest. It's going to push northwards heavy thundery showers during the weekend, but as well as an increasing risk of some heavy showers, it's going to be turning hotter and more humid. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. 
all sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, Nana, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I've walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, uh, suffering on a scale uh, completely uh, unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. It's two o'clock, a very good afternoon. You're with GB News Live. I'm Mark Longhurst, and coming up for you this Tuesday afternoon, uh, we'll be live in the United States for you. Uh, this is the scene at the Arlington uh, National Cemetery and Memorial in Virginia, just outside uh, Washington. Rishi Sunak uh, is due there shortly, uh, head, of course, uh, of his meeting with the president uh, and talks with President Joe Biden, politicians and uh, other business leaders. And uh, we were reflecting uh, on this occasion with the Guard of Honour there uh, waiting for the Prime Minister. Uh, more shortly from the United States, live for you here on GB News. In the other headlines, Hooray Harry dumped and visits a Spearmint Rhino nightclub. The latest headlines to be pulled apart in his High Court hearing. The cross-examination is finished. Next up, perhaps some friendlier questions from his own lawyer. We'll have the latest live from court. Downing Street says it's diverting more humanitarian aid to help Ukraine as the flooding from the dam sweeps through scores of towns and villages. President Zelensky saying hundreds of thousands of people now without drinking water, tens of thousands still stranded. 
And, of course, as we say, more on that visit of Rishi Sunak. Uh, can he re-establish that special relationship with his US counterpart, uh, the leaders to discuss AI, the actions of Putin and Ukraine, and the rise of China? Also coming up here on GB News Live, a new report coinciding with the anniversary of the arrival of HMS Windrush, suggesting that the UK is the best major democracy to live in for ethnic minorities. First, let's get an update on all the news headlines with Aaron. Good afternoon to you. It's two minutes past two here in the Juby newsroom. The Duke of Sussex says journalists at the Mirror Group newspapers went to extreme lengths to cover up phone hacking, which he claims took place on an industrial scale. Prince Harry's cross-examination concluded with him stating he believes phone hacking began at the Mirror Group and evidence of it has been destroyed. He was questioned about 33 articles which form the basis of his claim for damages. Uh, it alleges journalists from MGM publications used unlawful techniques to get stories. Harry told the court he believes the journalists thought it was a risk worth the reward. Uh, the publisher denies any wrongdoing. The Deputy Prime Minister and his Labour counterpart have clashed in PMQs over the COVID inquiry. Angela Rayner suggested the government uh, is abusing the judicial review. Oliver Dowden, though, defended the government's actions saying the Cabinet Office has handed over 55,000 documents so far. The Deputy Labour leader, though, also condemned the £21 billion worth of public money lost in fraud since the pandemic began, saying it could happen again if they refuse to learn lessons. If this government can't get the public money back, they can't be trusted with anything else. Yeah. It's become a pattern of behaviour from the Conservatives. An inquiry missing the evidence, schools missing their pupils, taxpayers missing their money and ministers missing in action. Yeah. And all the while, working people pay the price for their mistakes. What's the right honourable lady doing? receiving £10,000 from Just Stop Oil backers, oh, yes. backing protesters, blocking new production and forcing us to import more foreign oil and gas. I find myself in agreement with the GMB union. What did they say? It's naive, lacks intellectual rigour and could decimate communities. The head of the UN's aid programme has warned of grave and far-reaching consequences for southern Ukraine following the collapse of a dam yesterday. Martin Griffiths says people face losing their homes, food, safe water and livelihoods. Tens of thousands of people have been evacuated in and around Russian-controlled Kherson, with rising water levels expected to peak later today. Ukraine and Russia are continuing to accuse each other of being responsible for the explosion at the Nova Kalhovka Dam in what they say is an act of wartime sabotage. Meanwhile, Ukraine claims to have made advances of almost a mile over the last 24 hours near the eastern city of Bakhmut. Russia says it defeated enemy attacks near the city. The claims have not been independently verified. Oleksiy Danilov, that's Ukraine's head of national security, says Russia uh, and their claims that the long-awaited counter-offensive has started are incorrect. Aaron, thank you very much indeed. And, uh, let's take you back live to Arlington National Cemetery there in uh, Virginia. Uh, you just saw the uh, <laughs> Prime Minister, of course, who's visiting Washington uh, for that meeting tomorrow with the president. But this is at the tomb of the unknown soldier uh, here at the national ceremony. So the prime minister, uh, with his uh, respects being paid, uh, a wreath to be laid. And, of course, the military escort there. Just to remind you, of course, this coming uh, at the uh, time of the anniversary of D-Day with many of those American soldiers having joined British soldiers in those landings on the beaches of, uh, of Normandy. So a full guard of honour here in uh, Virginia, near to Washington, of course. And uh, the Prime Minister staying stock still in this moment of reflection with the salutes. And indeed, you can see the Union flag and uh, also 
uh, the Prime Minister's uh, fellow uh, number 10 staffers uh, with this occasion to cement this special relationship between uh, the United States and America. As I say, uh, the reflections this week, of course, uh, of the Allies and their actions back in 1944 on those beaches uh, of Normandy. Uh, and indeed, there'll be discussions in this meeting in Washington uh, over the situation in Ukraine, of course, with the United States and the UK uh, helping the Ukrainians in terms of uh, the counteroffensive that's underway and this huge humanitarian operation now that they'll have to help with. Uh, number 10 in the past hour indicating that more resources will be given to Ukraine and that uh, the UK working with UN and also the Red Cross to get help to people in the area of Kherson affected worst at the moment by the breach of that dam. So the Guard of Honour there, uh, very much at attention. I think there is uh, also some music being played, which we can't hear at the moment. But uh, Tom Harwood is with us here in the studio uh, watching this. So we were just reflecting, Tom, this is, uh, we think, about the fourth time that he'll be meeting uh, the president. But in terms of this special occasion, it ties in with these other events earlier this week in terms of, of D-Day and this transatlantic link between the UK and the US. It certainly does. Thousands of uh, American soldiers alongside Canadian soldiers and indeed British soldiers landed on those beaches in 1944, turning the tide of that war. And, uh, and it is uh, uh, an annual uh, commemoration that is made at Arlington National Cemetery, really the, the, the big national focus point for uh, Memorial Day and all those other American occasions. It sits just across the Potomac yep. River from Washington, D.C. It's uh, right next to where the Pentagon uh, sits. And, uh, and you can see it across there from, uh, from the, the Lincoln Memorial and, and, and other uh, famous sites. There's the wreath that the Prime Minister will be uh, placing at this, this tomb of the unknown soldier. Uh, a moment of reflection there. And, uh, of course, this is also where John F. Kennedy's remains are with the, the eternal flame as well. It's... Uh, a place of pilgrimage for many it Americans. It's a place of pilgrimage. It's a sacred place. In fact, there's a there's there's a story about the original uh, setting of the Pentagon. It was meant to be far closer to the cemetery, and it ended up being moved because it was not uh, deemed to be appropriate to have so much construction uh, near this 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 vast, sweeping, important uh, ce uh, cemetery uh, and indeed place of national reflection place of national mourning. Interestingly, the reason why the Pentagon is shaped as a Pentagon is due to the road structure in uh, ju just by the side of, uh, of, of, of this uh, Well, this apologies cemetery. for our camera here that clearly uh, we have a few difficulties with the uh, picture. Let's uh, obviously reflect uh, with Tom here in the studio that we, we saw the, the US Marines there uh, presenting arms. Um, the, uh, the red carpet has been rolled out for the mm. Prime Minister, it, it does seem, in this particular visit, because you were reflecting earlier that he's met Biden at the G7 and the other various international forums. Mm. This is very much bilateral uh, talks this time around. It is indeed. Now, the previous time that the Prime Minister went across to the United States, landed in San Diego, of all places, down in California, for the, yep. down in California for the AUKUS Pact. That was a, a trilateral meeting uh, with, of course, the, the, the Prime Minister of Australia, Anthony the Albanese, uh, as well as Joe Biden. This is Rishi Sunak's first independent solo trip to the United States to sit down one-on-one -on -one with Biden yeah. for the purpose of, of, of just those two meeting. The last time we saw them sitting down one-to-one -one was a rather awkward occasion in Dublin when they were sharing that cup of tea in a hotel. There wasn't much being said and there was a little bit of, of, well, not fallout, but certainly observation about the signals being sent by Biden on the whole issue of, of Northern Ireland and, uh, of course, Britain's involvement in the, the peace process. Absolutely. It was a short meeting. It was billed uh, by the White House as an informal discussion, uh, which uh, perhaps more people had been holding out on, on this side uh, of the pond for something that was more deep and, and a formal bilateral. Of course, there have been formal bilaterals between these, these two men, particularly at the G7 and at the G20. There's also been sideline discussions at 
the United yeah. Nations as well. No, we, we've got uh, issues of accord of uh, Ukraine, even though obviously the Republicans are questioning how long support for Zelensky should continue. Mm. Um, but there are issues that could be quite problematic uh, between the two sides, particularly on what the United States and Biden himself has been doing to support uh, the, the US sort of electric car industry and mm. other renewable industries and so on. Yes. Jeremy Hunt here, the chance to say, we're not going to go down that road. Mm. So, uh, you know, is, is Sunak going to say, please back off a little bit on this? Well, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, which has the unfortunate initialism of IRA, well, yes, um, but, yeah. has, uh, has, has caused a lot of ripples, um, um, not least in the United Kingdom, a because it's seen, as, it's seen as a very protectionist yeah. policy that, that is trying to revitalize American industry. Actually, there's a, there's a lot of politics and what's known as pork barrel politics that has gone into this as well. It just so happens that the massive state spending of this act is in a lot of those swing states mm. and in those former industrial districts. Rust Belt. The Rust Belt yeah. states that used to produce cars, now they're producing batteries that used to dig coal, now they're making wind turbines and solar panels. So you can see the politics there in terms of revitalizing American uh, industry. But again, that's subsidizing American industry mm. using taxpayer money or actually borrowed money. Um, and that is seen as anti competitive. That was the criticism, actually. Some pretty um, stark words from some cabinet ministers, particularly um, Kemi Badenoch, actually d described it as yeah, such. Uh, um, and, uh, and perhaps that's something that there, that there needs to be more discussions over. That's one big thing. But of course, the Prime Minister is is touting big American investment in the UK. Yeah. £16 billion pounds and, um, dollars announced today of inward investment from the United States to the United Kingdom. But it's not just business, uh, and it's not just trade, and it's not just Ukraine. The Prime Minister has a big, big issue on his mind, which is artificial intelligence. Yeah. And, he and wants specifically free... put this as, as one mat matter in, in encapsulated on its own. Uh, and, and this comes after all these warnings from the experts involved. Look, within two years, it could really be mm. a direct threat to us all. The rate at which AI is developing and progressing is faster than anyone had imagined. The intelligence and capabilities of this stuff uh, this year is just so much ahead of what it was last year. The, the idea is if it continues on this trajectory, it might well get ahead of us, escape our control. And this is why the Prime Minister wants the United Kingdom to host a conference on AI with all of the countries of the world coming to London in the autumn. He'll right. be talking to Joe Biden about that proposal, but also the idea that the UK could host a CERN-like institution. That CERN, of course, that, that organisation based in Switzerland, Switzerland that does yeah. particle physics. He wants something similar for AI based in the UK. But would those American tech giants decide that's the place to go, or where does it stay in California? Well, that's, that's, the big, that's the big question, and no doubt some tricky discussions right. in the White House tomorrow. Tom, thank you very much indeed for taking us through all that. Uh, of course, uh, that reef laying taking place uh, as we speak in Ireland but uh, the, conference, the uh, focus on uh, Washington tomorrow uh, as those talks continue. Uh, well, let's head back to London because Prince Harry's been at the High Court, of course, with his final testimony in that hearing against the Mirror Group newspapers group. Uh, he accused them of hacking voicemails when he was a teenager, saying he believes stories written in the publications causing security concerns, damaging his relationships, and that uh, journalists, in that quote, had blood on their hands. Well, his cro cross-examination has finished. But let's uh, head back to uh, the court and our Royal Correspondent Cameron Walker because yet more questions, albeit of a slightly more friendly nature perhaps, from his own lawyer this afternoon, Cameron. Yes, Mark, I think perhaps the hard part for Prince Harry is over. They're just wrapping up in the courtroom at the moment. David Sherborne, Prince Harry's barrister, is asking him a few final questions, which is due to last around 15 minutes. They break for lunch for an hour. Um, Harry, in the final couple of hours, I think, of his testimony, did appear to be uh, slightly weary on occasion and uh, irritable. He did interrupt the barrister, uh, Mr Andrew Green, Casey, representing Mirror Group newspapers on a number 
of occasions to clarify his point. It was an incredibly tough cross-examination, and that is what this barrister is notorious for, going through forensically with a fine-tooth comb every line uh, of the 33 articles which are being tested in this case. But now, of course, it's David Sherborne's turn to ask the questions. And he picks Harry up on the article which we talked about at, at length yesterday. The article would to do with Paul Burrell and the reported fallout between Prince William and Prince Harry when it came to not whether or not they would meet Diana's former butler, Paul Burrell. Now, the problem that Mirror Group newspaper barrister had with that particular claim was the fact that Prince Harry's memoir and Prince Harry's witness testimony said two different things. Prince Harry, in one of them, wanted to meet Paul Burrell. In the other, he didn't want to meet Paul Burrell. Um, so what the, his lawyer asked Prince Harry is, essentially, when did you change your mind? And Prince Harry came up with an answer that suggested that him and Prince William had a number of discussions over the Christmas period at Sandringham between 2003 to 2004, which is why, in fact, he changed his mind, which is um, after the article was written. So that was a point that was perhaps clarified. In terms of more broadly, the points which I think we need to get across here from, from the summary of the uh, cross-examination is um, Mr. Green came up with a number of other examples, as we talked about yesterday, of other media organisations, the Daily Mail, the former News of the World, the now defunct News of the World, etc., putting this information already in the public domain before Mirror Group newspaper journalist had written the article in which Prince Harry is uh, complaining about. Something which wasn't really talked about yesterday, but was talked about quite a lot in, in court today, was this idea of royal sources particularly when it came to articles relating to his relationship with, uh, between himself and his former girlfriend, Chelsea Davey, something which was pretty personable, uh, personal to him, and he did appear quite upset when discussing these articles in court today. Uh, but it's this idea that Prince Harry claims, maintains, that m members of palace staff would not have been told about the extent of Prince Harry's relationship with Chelsea Davey. Prince Harry says that is private information. He never would have shared that with any palace staffers. So then he questions why, in Mirror Group newspaper articles, palace sources are quoted as having information. Prince Harry believes that information was obtained um, unlawfully, and Mirror Group newspapers is clearly contesting that. Prince Harry continues to maintain that a lot of these articles are intrusive and unnecessary, uh, and, clearly, and he is clearly affected by these personal stories, particularly when it comes to Chelsea Davy. And in fact, Prince Harry made the point that Chelsea herself now has her own family, her own children, and it's equally as distressing for her to have to relive this as it is uh, for Prince Harry to live with this uh, as well. And David, Sher uh, sorry, not David Sherburn, Mr. Green made the point, the barrister representing Mirror Group newspapers, that actually whether or not the press was intruding into your private life, whether it was information that was uncomfortable and you believe was not in the public interest, that doesn't necessarily mean this is. Uh, Mr. Green's point of view, that the information was obtained unlawfully. Uh, and that is what he put to Prince Harry. And clearly, Prince Harry believes uh, that it was obtained unlawfully. But Mr. Green accused him of speculating rather than any hard facts. So, as I said, the case is about to wrap up it, well, the, with Prince Harry, um, and he is expected out of court probably in the next half an hour or so, unless there's uh, any last-minute uh, additions or questions which we're not expecting. Yeah, and we can see, obviously, the reporters and those camera crews waiting for uh, that occasion there. But uh, you're making an interesting point. It's not just about phone hacking, of course. It is this, this term, unlawful or illegal information gathering. I'm just looking at what David Sherborne's been asking him um, with this... Uh, uh, sort of few minutes of, of wrapping it up, um, where he's basically told uh, the court of a tracking device found on a car belonging to his former girlfriend, Chelsea Davey, and another friend, Mark Dyer, also finding a tracking device on his car. So it is a wider remit than just the whole issue of, of, of phone uh, hacking or, 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 or phones being intercepted. Yes, there are a number of allegations. Of course, phone hacking is just one part of it. There are a number of invoices which have been shown in court between uh, Mirror Group newspaper journalists and uh, in, in, private investigators who are known on previous occasions to be uh, linked to perhaps unlawful information gathering. But uh, the, the barrister representing Mirror Group newspaper, Mr. Green, was actually saying, well, that is not proof that uh, information was unlawfully obtained in these 
these 33 cases which are being tested in the court behind me. I think the other issue for Prince Harry, and this was talked about in court as well, there's an article <coughs> dating, I, I think it was 2004, um, of, of Prince Harry's mystery blonde in Argentina. Yeah. That did turn out to be Chelsea Davy, but it was this idea that the media around the world were desperately trying to find out who this mystery blonde was. And there were informants in the country who uh, essentially tipped off journalists, and they were the, some of the sources uh, which Prince Harry was not pleased with. But according to the barrister, Mr. Green, that was not unlawful information. It, uh, journalists were perfectly in their right to um, try and find out that information yeah. by using local sources. So uh, clearly Prince Harry believes that's intrusive, but whether or not it is unlawful, that's up to the judge. What used to be called muck raking uh, in my day. Uh, Cameron, for the moment, outside court, thank you for that. Back to you, of course, as we expect the, uh, the prince to appear and leave that hearing. But let's speak now to former political editor of The Sun, Trevor Kavanagh, who jo can join us. Trevor, thank you uh, for your time. It's interesting uh, that Mr Green, in his cross-examination earlier, was drawing parallels with Mirror Group. And, of course, what happened in a criminal trial involving News of the World or, or News Group? Yes, uh, uh, this is a rather sad story, an a, a, a unfortunate thing to witness. Prince Harry, once the most popular royal, who clearly cannot stop picking away at the emotional scabs that he feels that have been inflicted on him. Um, on the other hand, I cannot understand why his lawyers ever allowed him to go into court on this, because on the face of it so far, he's doing rather badly, and I, I, I cannot see how he's going to win this one unless he can link a specific story to a specific piece of illegal activity on behalf of Mirror Group newspapers. And, and the parallels being drawn by Andrew Green that was in the, the case of uh, News Group, there were, there were phone records, there was, there was hard evidence in terms of uh, what had been intercepted or allegedly intercepted. That's missing this time round. Yes, absolutely. And there isn't a single uh, example that I've heard anyway uh, that suggests that there is any evidence that um, illegal action was taken. I think there's also the broader fact that uh, Prince Harry himself has been found to have got some of his evidence wrong, or at least misconstrued evidence. And uh, in his own book, The, uh, the Autobiography Spare, I think that it's fair to say, as um, some have already pointed out, that if there's any, any intrusion into other people's privacy, Spare was a ran a, a, a truck through the uh, uh, royal family's private lives. So it's, it, it's somewhere, I, I think that the big problem for Harry is that the sympathy that I think was there for him from the beginning has almost totally evaporated, and this court case is not helping at, at all. Really? You, you don't think that there's a reassessment by some people when they've learnt, you know, he's had his day in court, what he's had to live through for, what, these decades and, and the intrusion uh, into his uh, private life, even though it may not be um, unlawful or illegal? Well, I think that the, the sympathy for him on that score is, is, is abundant, but it's mitigated, <laughs> excuse me, it's mitigated by the fact that he himself has gone out on television and in his memoir uh, to reveal things that the public, the royal family, the public never knew about the royal family's most intimate secrets. So it's very difficult to balance that. And I think that uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg made a very good point in his summary of this, his editorial on his show last night, that this is the freedom of the press which is uh, being challenged here. Freedom of the press is also free speech, and without it, we are not a democracy. And to suggest that uh, the uh, bloody fingers, the fingers covered in blood that type these stories is uh, an outrageous slur on decent journalists around the world. And if there were to come out, if there were to be any measure which uh, followed the uh, clear uh, wishes of this, uh, of, this uh, uh, of, the Prince, of Prince Harry, it would mean that there'd be restrictions on the freedom of the press. And I think that would be totally unacceptable. Do you think he was treated decently by the British press? No, I think that to be fair to him, and I think that that's where the reservoir of public sympathy would be if he, if he hadn't uh, rather damaged it himself. I think that everybody would see that this, uh, 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 after all, he was a boy of 14, yeah. uh, younger than that, uh, and uh, he was hounded by the press at the time in ways which would be intolerable now, and it simply wouldn't happen in this day and age. But right throughout his life, I think that 
He's been the subject of intrusion, which has been, um, which was unforgivable and remains unforgivable. Trevor Kavanagh, former political editor of The Sun, thank you for your reaction to this. Of course, as uh, we come to the uh, end of this uh, particular hearing, as we understand, uh, we've got uh, perhaps uh, another uh, few minutes to go. But thank you very much indeed for your uh, reaction to that. Let's turn uh, here in the studio uh, to Michael Cole, who's been following today's events, uh, royal commentator, and of course, former royal correspondent as well. So you saw this at the sharp end. Trevor was reflecting that this goes back to the days when he was a 14-year-old. It stayed with him. It's still very raw. Mm. But there is a difference between having a moan in court and actually proving a case legally. Absolutely. And what we're seeing now is the tail end of his ordeal under cross-examination in court. Uh, and it has been an ordeal. However well prepared you are, uh, nothing absolutely does prepare you for uh, withering cross-examination, which is what has been carried out quite fairly uh, and quite uh, properly by Andrew Green, who expressed his own sympathy to uh, Prince Harry over the loss of his, his mother at the age of 12 and so on. So what we're getting now is David Sherburn his own counsel, trying to fill in the gaps, trying to strengthen the allegations that he's made throughout his testimony. And the thing is, they are allegations, they are assertions, they are suspicions, but they are not evidence, they are not proof. And Mr Justice Fan Sam Fancourt is going to make absolutely sure that Prince Harry gets a fair ride. Uh, nothing will be done to disadvantage him. His case will be heard properly and openly and fully and dispassionately. But the judge at the end of the day can only act upon the evidence. And if the evidence isn't there, he cannot find in yeah. that plaintiff's favour. Now, there are other plaintiffs who are coming behind him. Yes, we should add that. I think three other parts of this case to come over yeah. some weeks. Now, they've got to come with something that resembles a smoking gun, because, as Trevor Kavanagh has just quite rightly said, we've, we've gone through all this testimony. There is nothing, there is not one single case out of these 33 allegations of illicit behaviour, which goes beyond hacking and blagging uh, and goes to uh, putting tracking devices mm -hmm. on vehicles and so on. There's not one case that has been tied to a single s story or a single reporter. And Trevor Cavan is quite right. The men and women who wrote these stories are employed in an ancient and valuable trade which is important to the democracy of this country. They probably think of themselves as decent, upright, well-standing people in the community with families who pay their taxes. Yeah. They're being accused of criminality. Now, when you come and accuse somebody of a crimin criminal offence for which a felony, for which they may go to jail, you better come with some very heavy evidence. And what has happened here is either the prince has not been well advised or he hasn't been well prepared. I cannot imagine that they didn't do some amazing wargaming on this. It would have been completely wrong well, to yeah, coax him. I mean, him. Th this is an interesting point. I mean, we, we should point out, of course, that legal teams here in the UK cannot coach their witnesses. They cannot. That can take place in the United States. Well, maybe. And but... he has been in California, perhaps, for some time previously. Anyway, let me just touch on something to, yeah. to pick up on what you were saying there. David Sherborne, his lawyer, has been speaking to him in the last few minutes. Apparently, he's, he said he's asked the prince if he believes his claims of unlawful activity are in the realm of total speculation. That that phrase used yeah, by Andrew yeah, yeah. Green, Casey, has put him in cross-examination. The prince has replied, no, I don't, and it is even more destructive and it was used as a headline, I think, this morning in the newspapers against me. So this beef he's got is continuing even in the way that this case is being covered by the press. <laughs> you know... We're just Mark. being told he's, he's finished giving evidence, so okay, well, the, there the we curtains are. come down That's for the moment. That's an historic moment. We've seen some history here. Nobody alive has ever seen a royal prince go into the witness box, ever. That yeah. hasn't happened. Pr Princess Anne was in, in court for dangerous she, dogs where she pleaded she, guilty. She pleaded yep. guilty and uh, that, that, that was done and dusted. Interestingly, in the, uh, in the inquest into the deaths of Diana and Dodie in 19, uh, 2007 eight. 
Uh, the Duke of Edinburgh was called as a witness, and he was permitted by the judge, Mr. Justice Scott Baker, Thomas Scott Baker, to send his private secretary on his behalf to give right. evidence on his behalf. Quite an extraordinary thing. So there is nothing in the unwritten British constitution which says a royal prince cannot yeah. go into the witness box. Yeah. But it happens very rarely, and when you've seen what's happened, one has to ask, well, is it wise when they do? And there are other cases pending, other hearings pending as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, do you believe that... Uh, he, we don't know if it's going to be the same legal team representing him, whether there will be a reassessment according to which way this goes yeah. uh, and, and uh, the judge decides on... Uh, you know, remind people again, the balance of probability, that yeah. phrase we keep yeah, hearing. He's got... Uh, uh, he's the prince of litigation. He's got five, <laughs> five, five cases going uh, and he's really going for it. And this is motivated by the hurt, the very real, raw hurt that he feels. Um, now, what we're going to get here, we've, th th there's several weeks to go. There are the other plaintiffs. He's the star plaintiff, but there are other plaintiffs. And then the judge will reserve his judgment and then he will deliver his judgment at, at a later date. Which could, uh, could be some weeks off, if, I would, if not longer. It could be months. Yeah. It could be months. So we don't know when we're going to get that, and we don't know whether that's going to colour the decisions that are going to be made. Um, the, the, the prince has, has the bit between his teeth. He feels he's a crusader. He said at the outset, before he even went in the witness box, that he was out... To, to save the, the British press from itself. Mm. He called the British tabloid press. He called it the mothership of internet trolling. In other words, it instigated the sort of monstering that goes on on the internet, which is deplorable. Yeah. And, and rock bottom, the phrase he used on that, and indeed the politics and the, and the government as well. Now, very ill-advised. Yeah. Very ill-advised to drag politics into it. It's a, a, a big no-no that, the, that the, uh, the, 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 the monarchy does not uh, criticise directly or indirectly. Therefore, what do you think King Charles will be making of this? I mean, we understand that he tried to advise Harry not to go down this route. Suicidal, we think, was the phrase that was used at that time. Yeah. Well, <laughs> he's probably made a great statement by going off to Transylvania, of all places, to as get out of the way. As, as you far, can get. Get in a That's... castle in Transylvania. You know, <laughs> Dracula's better than this. But um, he will, he will uh, have deplored it. He, he, he's in... You know, the king is now inured to the things that have happened to him in life. He's going to do things his own way. Uh, and uh, he, 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 he's seen it all, he's heard it all, he's taken it all on board. He won't... He will still love his son, I can tell you that. Yeah. And he will still want a reconciliation at some time. Relief, perhaps, that there haven't been further embarrassing relations about the rest of the royal family? No, there haven't been... You know, there hasn't been that sort of a revelation. As I said, we, when we've gone through the, the evidence and we've all looked at it and read the testimony, I mean, there's no smoking gun there. There's no, there's no even a gun there. Mm. I mean, there's nothing you can say, that's the moment, that's the gotcha moment, where it's proved that the Mirror Group were doing illegal things which resulted in these 33 stories, oh, yeah. which so annoyed them. Although, although obviously, at the, at the very outset, that they have acknowledged one instance there was. And, and, and have apologised for that. And yeah. that, has, that matter was settled, and that was, that was admitted at the front. So, I mean, does one admission then say, yes, OK, we did this bad thing, we've apologised for it, we've settled it, but we're going to contest these? It, it's now really a question for the judge. He will give... Uh, every uh, every sympathy uh, to 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 the prince, and it's quite clear that the hurt he feels is real. His belief is profound. Mm. His anger is incandescent. It goes back a long, 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 long way. Mark, uh, I can just tell you, before Harry was three years old, his parents went on a holiday to Mallorca with the two children, and the King of Spain. Yes, Juan Carlos. Yeah. Juan Carlos. Yeah. Juan Carlos wanted. Mallorca to come up a bit. Indeed. To improve its image. Because the king had a, had a, a summer residence there. Yes, yeah. he bought, yeah. he bought an, a, an old uh, industrialist yeah. mansion. So we were invited, the International Press Corps, were invited to take pictures of the two royal families sitting together on the steps. Charming pictures. So the whole of the Nikon choir was there. OK. Harry was not yet three. He escapes his mother's grasp and he comes across a gravel drive, and he picks up two handfuls of, sh of shingle, and he says, go away, men's, go away, men's. He wasn't three. 
That's how he felt about the press intrusion. And he was always being filmed, putting his tongue out at photographers, much to his mother's dismay, because she knew that picture would go. So this goes way, way, way back. I think what we have to ask ourselves is, why was it suddenly reactivated in 2018? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, we're just getting the clock, uh, basically almost eight hours of questioning, uh, most of it cross-examination, of course. And we, we were hearing that he bumped into, was mm-hmm. the phrase, uh, uh, David Sherborne, the, the lawyer in France in 2018, and this resulted um, in, in this coming about. Um, one wonders whether he, at that stage, decided, I'm going all out, even though I don't think I've probably got much chance of succeeding in court. Mm. I want this out there in the public arena and everything to be heard in, in, in the public. Yeah, and I imagine, as he got, was getting married at, at Meghan, she must have been consulted on that, she must have encouraged him in that course. Maybe she felt it was a way of expiating yeah. the feelings that, that he's had. But interestingly, David Sherman was trying to, as I say, strengthen the points and clarify things, which was in a re-examination. But there is one key point there, which is quite interesting, Mm. because they named... I'm not going to name him, because although it is privileged, they named the person who allegedly put the bug... Uh, the tracker device on Chelsea Davies' car. Yeah. Now, and this came has, right at the end of the question. It comes right yeah. at the end. Yeah. Is there any attempt, or has there been any attempt, to uh, to place this miscreant, this person who did this, was he in the employer of Mirror Group? <laughs> Is there yeah. any evidence that he was? Yeah, because obviously a, a lot of allegations are made about private detectives in, all, in a lot of these cases, but again, it's proving that link. Were they in the direct employ of any particular mm. um, publication? Precisely. Were they acting on their own behest and then whatever they found, maybe they could sell on subsequently? Well, there is that too, but, um, you know, has, have they established that? I mean, Harry's looked at some fairly modest payments to private investigators mm. that have been made. Well, that may have been quite routine in the way that the, the Mirror Group newspapers did things. But the, it, you, what you want is the causal link, something which says this illegal act was procured or ordered by yeah. or paid for by Mirror Group newspapers. Otherwise, you're, 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 you're accusing a, a very well-established and highly respected uh, newspaper group with a history of more than 100 years of criminal activity on a, on a mafia-style scale. Yeah. Um, ju- just to reiterate, so we, we, we know exactly what was said in court in terms of, of his allegation, uh, he told the court directly he once found, personally, found a tracking device on the car belonging to his former girlfriend, Chelsea Davey, uh, and also a friend, Mark Dyer, had found a tracking device on his car, the significance being... Uh, he alleges this was placed at the time uh, of a so-called make-or-break holiday that he had with Chelsea Davey. Yeah. Uh, and this has been one of the themes uh, about the relationship between the two of them, mm. which broke down, it seems, because mm. of this intrusion. And one mm. perhaps has some sympathy with total, him... Total, total. In, ..in wanting this to be revealed to the world as yeah, well. Yeah, total, total. I mean, anybody carrying on a romance... With anybody who you, who you love, you don't want... Photographers in the bushes you and don't, so on, yeah, you, do, yeah. you don't want that to happen, and particularly if, if it embarrasses the person uh, you're engaged with or you, you love or you, or, or you have affectionate towards. You don't want it to happen. And, of course, one is entitled to feel angry. We all would, but you don't actually go to the High Court about it. What happens next? I mean, we assume he's going to leave court now fairly shortly, perhaps go back to California. Uh, mm. There are these other court cases mm. pending. Mm. Um, does he carry on in the same vein? Does he, you know, bet the farm, if you like? Well, um, I, I don't think he's going to hang around for the rest of the, uh, the, the evidence that's going to give, be given. I'm sure he's keen to get back to see his children, see his wife, get back to California. But now we've got the other plaintiffs. Um, Cheryl Cole, no relative of mine, um, a a famous singer, uh, used to be called Cheryl Tweedy, if I'm getting it right. She's had several names. Uh, Ian Wright, the former Arsenal footballer, who's a football commentator, a very talented man. And I think the estate of the late uh, George Michael. All of these people are plaintiffs. Of course, Prince Harry was the star witness. He was the star plaintiff. And they come in later. Now, those uh, parties, should we put them like that, people and parties, have got to demonstrate, if they can, to the court, a real link 
a provable link, evidential link, mm. from illicit, illegal activity impinging upon their privacy against the law and mirror group newspapers. Now, Harry has said, I think in, in, in testimony today, uh, that they covered their tracks pretty well. Well, it seems they did because he has not been able, uh, to my reading of it, to have established a direct link between the mirror mm. and illegal activity involving him or his close friends. Yeah. And Trevor Kavanagh's point about the, the fallout from this, and that is that there should still be the ability of a free press to ask questions, however those questions are asked. I tell you what, there's never been uh, a greater need for a free press in this country. Never. And uh, otherwise, well, we see some of the scandals we see. Can you imagine the ones that would get shoved under the Persian carpet. Or a subject to legal injunctions. I Indeed. just throw that in for a Indeed. observation. Indeed. That all goes on. And I, I think, uh, you know, newspapers um, are influential. Some of them are powerful. But some of them are in trouble. I don't think the independent will be the last one who goes online only. And under, they're under ter terrific pressure. Uh, because of advertising patterns change. Yeah. You never see a young person on the train reading a newspaper unless, I, unless they're on, you they're do. They're on the phone. Yeah. They're on the phone. Yeah. So it's all changed. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not just talking this. I actually believe in it. Uh, I was one of the people hacked by the news of the world. That, that incidentally, was exposed by a free press yeah. in this country. Another newspaper. Another newspaper exposed that scandal. Two people went to jail. Uh, I was one of the people who was hacked. I got a letter of apology from a senior executive at News Group and I got a modest sum of, um, uh, of damages. I was asked by my, my solicitor, do you want to join the joint action against the Daily Mirror Group? And I said no. And I said no for two reasons. Right. One, I don't want to spend what's left of my life fighting legal actions. I'm not interested in it. And secondly, I don't believe in the in the justice of pursuing newspapers. Of course, mistakes will always be made, but they're honest mistakes. Right. Um, given we haven't quite got the feeding frenzy nowadays that we had at that time, um, Diana's gone and, and clearly... That changed things. That changed things. However, are you glad that you're out of the game now and don't have to pursue these matters and, and all the, the sort of competition that went on between both the broadcasters and the papers to get these stories, no matter how? Well, strangely enough, Mark, as you asked me that, I I've written a piece in a new book called Reporting Royalty, which charts how things changed mm. from deference to death in Paris. This article tells you exactly what happened. But you ask a very good question. When I was on the road doing this for a long, long time, and I wrote my first royal story 61 years ago, <laughs> can you believe it? We acted properly. We acted, we, we were all, you cannot report from a kneeling position, okay? The story must come first. Mm. But there are certain standards, there were decencies that were observed, there was integrity about things. Of course, the royal family accepted that. Her Majesty the Queen even said to me, 50% of my life, my work, is being seen. Yes. I have to be seen. Hence the hats and the loud coats and so on and so forth. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. She didn't love those bright colours. Mm. But that was the constitutional purpose. 50% of my job, she said, is being seen. And there are amusing anecdotes when she cut short things. If the press weren't there, they were Her Majesty's core <laughs> of yeah. press reporters. So, but there were standards and there were things you didn't do and you certainly didn't do them when children were there. Uh, but you, you were there to do a proper job. And there are reporters at work now, today, who do that job brilliantly. Yeah. But when did the game change? I mean, we've been reflecting on what happened with the news of the world and a criminal case. Without, you know, wishing to cast aspersions on other journalists, was it that the Murdoch press that changed the game, it became a lot more uh, cutthroat and, and commercial in terms of pursuing royal stories? I can tell you exactly when it changed. I can tell you exactly. There was always a royal rota. The Queen never gave exclusives to anybody. Mm -hmm. Everything was shared. She knew that if she gave an exclusive, 
the people who didn't get the exclusive would resent it, and the competition for exclusives would, would increase. It would up the ante. The, up the ante. And what happened was, in 1985, ITN brought out a, a, a two programmes shown in tandem. One was called The Prince and Princess of Wales in, in public, mm. The Prince and Princess of Wales, more tantalisingly, in private. And they had been given, ITN, an exclusive that lasted one whole year to do these programmes. Now, those programmes were sold around the world and they were shown and they were very pleasant. The royal family had put themselves in the shop window to be admired. Other people didn't take that view. And then you suddenly had the situation where you had the Princess of Wales, mm. Diana, and you had the Duchess of York, mm. Fergie, and they were going in and out like the weathermen, and one was up and one was down. And it was showbiz. It was show business, and it coincided with the time when there was a huge expansion in news outlets, and the news became celebrity-led. Yeah, yeah. They became... They stepped down from their pedestal and they became celebrities. And that, I'm afraid, disastrously led to the pursuit. Right. And this was the point that we believe the Queen Mother made when she objected to the original 1969 film that the BBC <laughs> may or tried to make with the royal family? No, the BBC... Yeah. Well, they, they made it and it, went, made out it. Once. The, it went out once. The BBC yeah. made it, yeah. but, 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 Her Majesty the Queen retained the copyright and that programme has never been shown in its entirety since, just excerpts. And what happened was the BBC made it it was the Queen's programme, and it was shown on the BBC, and it was shown on the other channel, ITV, the same night. Nobody had an exclusive. Mm. It's when the royal family started giving exclusives oh, right. that there was competition. And that's what happened. Fascinating stuff. Well, the cameras are still there waiting, so it's still a story. Uh, of course, <laughs> waiting for Prince Harry to leave that court, uh, as is Cameron, uh, who's been following uh, the events of these past three days, of course, to remind people. Um, Cameron, our royal correspondent, is there uh, because of Cameron. It started on Monday uh, without the, the, the Duke of Sussex, we remember. Prince Harry wasn't there on that first day. No, he wasn't. And the judge actually said he was pretty surprised that Prince Harry was not there on Monday because he had said during a preliminary hearing for this trial that he expected witnesses to be available the day before they are due to give evidence just in case opening uh, statements ran short and that no time was wasted. Prince Harry gave the excuse that he wanted to be in California for his daughter, Princess Lilibet's birthday. I mean, he flew into London overnight uh, on the Sunday. But nonetheless, he has been been cross-examined pretty hard, uh, pretty, uh, he's been cross-examined for a day and a half now. He has finished uh, the cross-examination. His own lawyer, David Sherborne, uh, also asked him a few questions just to round things off this afternoon. Uh, and I'm just going to read out this quote. David Sherborne, Prince Harry's barrister, said, you've been sat in the witness box for over a day and a half. You've had to go through these articles and answer questions in a very public courtroom knowing the media is watching. How does that make you feel? Now, Prince Harry took a moment to pause before he gave his answer, and he said, it's a lot, and his voice did actually crack at that point. He did appear, appear um, a little bit emotional because it has been a day and a half of going through highly personal stories and dragging up pretty, let's say, upsetting memories for the prince over the last day and a half. He even confessed today that, uh, because a lot of the articles included uh, were written about him and his former girlfriend Chelsea Davy, that it has been equally distressing for Chelsea as well, because she has now moved on and has a family of her own. But clearly Prince Harry feels the need to stand in a witness box and give evidence, the first royal to do so since the 19th century, because he believes that, un that information was unlawfully obtained by Mirror Group newspapers in order to write stories about him. Now, 33 of those stories were tested in court over the last day and a half, dating from 1996 all the way up until 2010. 
What um, Mr. Andrew Green, the KC who has been representing Mirror Group newspapers in all of this, he's been very uh, meticulous with his detail, and it's been quite forensic analysis for Prince Harry to cope with. Someone, of course, Prince Harry is used to Oprah interviews or you know uh, quite friendly interviews to do with promoting his memoir Spare. This was quite a difficult grilling for Prince Harry, and some of the issues that Prince Harry's run into. One of the main ones is that a lot of the information in these 33 articles by Mirror Group publications was already in the public domain. Either other uh, media outlets had written up the, article, the information a day or two before or even a week before, or a palace spokesperson had confirmed the information to uh, the Mirror Group newspapers. Now, Prince Harry did... Um, uh, did, did argue the points that, well, the palace would never release personal information about me, so therefore when the publication went to the palace with a question, they must have got information from somewhere. Uh, Prince Harry said on a number of occasions, I lost count over the last two days, that it was highly suspicious about some of the information that uh, the newspapers tend to have on him. So we're talking about alleged phone hacking here. We're talking about the, uh, the allegation that Mirror Group journalists paid private investigators to uh, essentially unlawfully obtain information about Prince Harry and those close to him, as well as so-called blagging. And as I said, there was a number of um, articles referenced in this. Today, they focused on this idea of a royal source. A lot of anonymous sources are quoted in these 33 Mirror Group newspaper articles, um, giving quite personal details. Now, Prince Harry believes that that is just a front or a cover-up um, for phone hacking or another kind of unlawful information gathering, whereas Mirror Group newspaper's Casey lawyer was pointing out that Royal sources could come from anywhere within the palace or could come from a friend of a friend or, you know, a pub manager who rang the paper to say that, oh, Prince Harry is here having a drink with so-and-so um, and was accusing Prince Harry essentially of having a lot of speculation and no hard core concrete facts. And Prince Harry was saying that a lot of this phone hacking really was, uh, well, alleged phone hacking, was carried out with burner phones and therefore all the evidence has been destroyed and therefore he is just left with um, circumstantial evidence. So Prince Harry has finished his testimony here. He has finished answering questions and uh, we are expecting him to leave the courtroom and the court building pretty shortly. Indeed. We'll, we'll stay in these pictures with the, the waiting uh, reporters and cameras, but uh, let me just uh, bring some breaking news elsewhere from the media uh, with suggestions that the Daily and Sunday Telegraph and the Spectator magazine uh, will be put up for sale uh, due to debts owned, uh, owed by its parents group. Now, this is uh, via Lloyds Banking Group saying it's looking to recover debts owed by the network of companies controlled by the Barclay family, which includes the Telegraph. Um, the Barclay family, however, saying the loans did not affect newspaper operations, but a statement saying that the business within a portfolio uh, trading strongly and the Telegraph extremely uh, performing extremely well. However, Lloyds Banking Group is understood to have appointed uh, an official receiver to sell assets to re pay debts owed by the network of holding companies, um, possibly uh, about £500 million pounds or more. Um, but um, both the Lloyds Banking Group and Alex Partners, uh, who are the ones directly involved, declining to comment. Uh, let's get the last thought on this, uh, Michael Cole. You were talking about yeah. the future of the, the, the media. Well, there we are. Absolutely. We, that was the, the Barclay twins, uh, David and Frederick. They owned the Ritz Hotel, they loaned Elliman Lines, uh, shipping lines. Uh, they were two lowland Scots who came down here. They lived in Acton, West London, and they started by buying up and decorating um, houses in Paddington, 100 yards, 150 yards from where we're sitting now. Which is not very built, expensive properties. And they yeah, built yeah. a great empire. Yeah. There's been a terrible falling out within the family. One of the twins died. I think I'm right in saying it was David who died a couple of years ago, Frederick, his twin, and they were extremely close. They used to even comb each other's hair. They, that's how close they were. Uh, has fallen out with the children of the dead twin. And uh, it's a sad thing. There'll be buyers. Yep. The Telegraph will continue.
but the confirmation coming through perhaps a little later, but certainly uh, questions as to who will be the new owners of that media group. But uh, as we see with the pictures, we are still waiting outside the court there uh, for Prince Harry to uh, appear. Uh, and of course, uh, that um, evidence has been uh, gone through in some detail. We'll see what comes in the weeks to come in terms of the judges uh, summing up and uh, indeed his decision. Uh, but more coming up uh, with Patrick throughout the afternoon. Stay with us here on GB News Live. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, nah, no, nah, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel.